Um, the, uh, my contribution is going to be to tell you guys a little bit about what big data is and give you a foundation of the types of tools people use to analyze information of this type. Uh, I'm not an autonomous by training, I'm an engineer, um, statistician in my background. term is the fact that it's not very well defined. That's part of the reason that's very popular these days. But to me, big data means um, a couple of things. The engineer in me knows that it means what Matt's going to talk about briefly, which is big data is data that's so big you can't fit it on your computer. You can't just pull it into Stata and start inverting matrices and fitting lines through things. You have to do multiple little analyses on slices of your data, thinking about splitting up your sample, thinking about splitting up your dimension, thinking about projecting into different dimensions, things like that. So from an engineering perspective, big means distributed, and that's a lot of the stuff that I do. But we're not going to start with that today. We're going to talk with big, which is just high dimensional in the sense that it's tough to measure the types of models that we like to use in statistics and econometrics. So big data for me today for the in initial introduction is going to be basically data mining. How do we fit patterns in high dimensions and how do we do it well so that we're not doing bad data mining but that we're doing good data mining. The outline for my entire morning. So I have like three talks this morning. You guys are going to get very tired of me. Um, the, the first uh, sort of thing that we're going to go through is we're going to talk about just generally overview what is good data mining. Okay, so I'm going to define for you the goals of my three lectures today, which is a narrow piece of big data, but like I said, it's a foundation for everything else you're going to do. And what I think that is, is discovery without overfit, and I'll tell you precisely what that means in a second. And for most of today, discovery and model selection and all of these kind of high flute in terms mean variable selection. The thing that everybody here knows how to do, which is setting betas to zero or setting betas not equal to zero. So there's three main ingredients to this. This is how I'm going to break it down. The first one is how do we evaluate what is a good model and what is a bad model, okay? Moreover, even before we evaluate it, what are the metrics, the, the sort of yardsticks upon which we want to evaluate these models, which we want to measure whether they're good or bad. We're going to talk about things called false discovery proportion, talk about out-of-sample deviance, out-of-sample predictive performance. We're going to talk about model probabilities. Now these are idealized things, and we're going to talk about how in the real world, faced with data, we estimate how well our model is doing upon each of these yardsticks. And then finally, we're going to talk about, well, how do we come up with sets of models that we can compare upon our estimated measure of these model metrics up here. And I really don't know how long these things are going to take. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, depending upon how much we have in terms of questions at the end of each section, uh, if there's time and depending upon how much time we have, we'll go into some discussion of factor models, principal components, regression, some of these other techniques that, that, uh, that come to play. The probably messing with the videographer by moving over here. But the um, way I wanted to start out is with an example. Uh, there's a lot of vague terms thrown around like big data, like discovery, and like overfit. And here's a concrete example. We're going to depart from it a little bit at the beginning, and then we'll get back to it at the end, about what I mean by a high dimensional data mining example. So here's some ComScore web data. I think Pretty much everybody here is familiar with what Comscore does. If you're not, what they do is they have a panel of households every year, about 100,000 households, I think it's up to now. And they put a little black box on top of your computer and they track all of the websites that you go to and all of the things that you purchase online. Um, so you have very, very detailed information about browsing history and purchasing behavior. It's about 100,000 households. About 60,000 of those, there's any money spent. So these are people that were actually active in online consumption. This is back in 2006. This is an older data set. And what I've done is, uh, for an example we'll look through a little bit today, I've extracted info for about the 8,000 websites that were visited by at least 5% of people. Okay? So you have 60,000 households that bought anything, 8,000 of these 
uh, or sorry, 60,000 households that bought anything, and the dimension kind of of the space that you're looking at, the, the covariate space, the websites they might have visited is about 8,000. So A, why would we care about data like this? Okay. Well, as the kind of the engineer or somebody who works at a business school, I might just want to predict consumption from browser history, right? I want, might want to know, given you know, the cookies that are associated with your website, when you land on my website, which ad should I show you, okay? This is most of what goes into digital marketing, right? These ad firms that are saying that they have targeted strategies, et cetera, they're doing things like that. Sorry, I'll stop moving on here. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, so that's the kind of the baseline. I think everybody gets that, okay? As econometricians, as economists, that might be a little bit of a harder sell. Economists, I've learned in my few years at the business school, are not necessarily so worried about prediction, okay? You're more worried about figuring out parameters and structural models that explain scientifically the way the world works. Okay, so why would we care about something like this, this big high dimensional prediction problem? Well, you might have, for example, some study where you get to observe people and some behavior of those people as a reaction to some treatment. For example, we see whether or not they click on an online advertisement. Okay? The treatment there would be the fact that we've shown them an advertisement. The effect would be the fact that they've clicked on the advertisement or maybe even purchased something. That's probably what you're really interested in. And the model in question would be one of the efficacy of advertisement, which is, hey, what's the causal effect of the fact that I showed these people an advertisement? How did that change their consumption behavior? Well, in anything like that, you're going to want to control on a lot of stuff. But one thing you're definitely going to want to control on is kind of how much do these people spend in general? What's their aggregate level of spending? Okay, is, is this like Mr. Moneybags clicking on my ad or is this someone who never, uh, never buys anything online? Okay. Well, you're typically not going to see that. So what you could do is you could take the map from browser history to what that says about how much you spend online and use those variables, use that map to control for the information, the confounding variable that you don't have, which is the amount of money that people spend online. Okay? So in this setting, you want to solve for an effect where you have a treatment and an effect, and this is what Chris is really going to be talking about tomorrow, okay? and prediction of each of those two things is key to getting the job done. The potential regressions that we could have here, we could have logistic regression. I'll get into exactly what all these mean in a second with equations and such. The probability that people spend at all given x. And there's a little, one of the little causal things I've done in here is looking at, hey, does broadband affect whether or not their internet speed is fast? Does that affect whether they spend anything online? Or just given that they have spent some money, what's the probability that they've, they've, they've uh, uh, what's the distribution for how much money that they've spent? Okay. Um, X here, okay, to get back into big picture example of what we're looking at, X here, like I said, is just websites, okay? In raw form, it's just counts for the fact that you visit a website. So X1 is I've gone to google.com, I don't know, seven times. X2 is I went to bing.com four times, okay? Um, in particular, beyond that, what I've done is I've changed the X to proportion of time that you spend online. So say 1% on, on Google, 1% on Bing, something like that, okay? But beyond that, there's much, much more that you could do here. And when I'm faced with things like this, we often do this. We follow the websites and we would look at, hey, what are the text? What are the images on these websites? Okay, maybe two domain names look exactly the same, but we could go out there and we could grab the text, the images on these websites, and start to regress onto that information, which would give us a richer picture of this person's browsing history. Or if you're someone like Facebook, or if you're someone who pays for the information from NIP, you can go in there and you could grab all of this person's uh, uh, Facebook's posts, whatever's public, all of their friends' Facebook's posts, okay? So there's a lot, lot more that you can do. And this afternoon, Matt and Jesse are gonna talk a little bit about text mining, um, which obviously plays a role in almost all of this big data stuff, just because that's the way the data's coming at us. So that's kind of the motivating example that I want you guys to have in your mind when you're trying to consider, hey, is this stuff that he's telling me going to work or is it, is it not a very good idea? Now, what is data mining? Okay, DM, data mining. It's discovering patterns in high dimensional data. And that's going to be the narrow piece of big data that we're going to focus on today. 
What do I mean by high dimensional? This is a bit of a vague term. I'll try and make everything precise. Data that's usually big in both the number of observations and in the number of variables. Okay, so number of observations, statistician, always n. Number of variables, always p. Okay, that's big data when both those are big. But really, your life gets tough and it becomes what I would refer to as high dimensional whenever p is anywhere close to n. Okay, so whenever the number of variables that you have is anywhere close to some significant portion of the number of observations that you have. In scientific applications, right, what everybody here wants to do, social science applications, we want to summarize the high dimensional data in order to relate it to some sort of structural model of interest, right? So I want to say, hey, here's my big high dimensional web browsing history. I need to boil this down to information about confounding variables that affect the regression I'm interested in, okay? That's kind of a structural model projection there. We also, okay, those of us that work in kind of reduced form world, we also just sometimes want to predict. We want to build machines that tell you what book you want to buy or what movie you want to rent or what the market's going to do, et cetera, okay? So these are the two big goals, and we're going to look at both of these goals today because, as I mentioned, they're very closely linked. The goals overlap, and they have one overarching aim, and that is dimension reduction. Okay? So what do I mean by dimension reduction? Okay? Well, first we have to think about, again, these two slightly separate but very closely related goals, those of prediction and inference. Okay? In some sense, and this is going to be what I use to justify for the rest of the day just talking about prediction, in some sense it's all about prediction. In a predictive model where we want to forecast, like I said, just, hey, what is this person going to buy? I'm going to use this to say, you should buy this book over here. You like this book, you should buy this movie, whatever. We're just trying to predict Y from X, where both are drawn from some joint distribution. So things are not changing over time. We're not making policy decisions that change the relationship between X and Y, or the joint distribution between X and Y. We just have this aggregate world that's moving through. And we say, hey, if we capture enough signal from that aggregate world, that uncertain aggregate world, then we can make a prediction about what's going to happen next. Again, that's probably not what everybody here is looking at. You're looking at causal models, and you want to forecast why, given some gain, X is some covariates out there, but one of them special, and you call it D, and that thing is special because it's a treatment, and you want to understand causally what that treatment means. Okay. The problem is the same. It's still one of prediction. It's just now you want to predict for y given d and x when d changes, but x is held constant. So they're no longer just moving randomly together. d is something you get to move. Maybe you're a central banker and it's the interest rate, or maybe it's the advertising thing and you're the person that gets to show the ad. In either case, dimension reduction here, the key goal that I'm talking about is either in the direction of y, okay, so dimension reduction that's relevant for y, or dimension reduction that's relevant for both d and for, uh, and for y, okay. We will learn to walk before we can run, which is what we, why we're going to do this prediction stuff first. We're going to learn about predicting y from x or d from x, whatever you can consider it to be. And then tomorrow, the way this is going to split up is Victor and Chris are going to tell you a lot about, hey, if you have a good model for predicting treatment from X, and if you have a good model for predicting uh, response from X, how do you combine that information in, to do, in order to do good causal modeling? Okay? So today we're going to learn to walk. Tomorrow you're going to learn how to run. Here's an example of what I mean by dimension reduction. And I want to you know, maybe give you guys some motivation by telling you that economists already do very good data mining and very good dimension reduction. I know that in economics, data mining is a bit of a pejorative term and has a negative connotation. Um, that's because often you guys have seen bad data mining. It turns out that economists also do good data mining. And here's an example of it. So this is a, this is bad data mining. This would just be a fancy plot. These are, these are stock returns um, for, I don't know, I think it's about 50, 30 stocks. Um, 1992 to 1996, the S&P 500 is in bold, okay? This is like when you look on TV, you see an ad for Ameritrade or E-Trade or one of those sites, they have a dashboard up and the guy's got the dashboard, it's got a plot like this on it and it shows the stocks moving and you say, oh, if only I had that dashboard, I'd be rich. Um, but, but really you look at this and you're not getting that much information out of it, okay? 
the sort of good data mining, good dimension reduction version of this, one of the good dimension reduction version of this, is a factor model. Okay? In particular, the simplest of those is going to be your CAPM, your capital asset pricing model. What we do here is we just regress these returns onto the market. We're regressing the dark line onto all of the colorful lines. Okay? And what we get out of that is a relationship between the individual stocks and the market. Okay? We get a two-dimensional key that tells us a ton of information about how these different companies move, how these equities move, um, and, and what we can do to predict their movements in the future. Because it's going to be easier to predict the aggregate market than it is going to be to predict a single stock. So if we reduce dimension in the direction of something that's easier to predict, well, then it becomes easier to predict the other thing as well. It's also, so it's good predictive data mining. Okay? So these guys were doing good predictive data mining. Okay? You guys all know the history of this stuff. It comes from an economic story as well. Right? You have the efficient market story that gets laid on top, and that's how you interpret these factors. Okay? And in that sense, because it comes from this falsifiable, testable sort of you know, story, this narrative around the things that you're measuring, the things that you're reducing dimension towards, it's also good structural data mining. Okay? So this is the type of, of, of work that we would like to replicate in higher dimensions, uh, perhaps with less of a story to start with. So, so, data mining, which for me today is going to be big data, is the discovery of patterns in high dimension. Okay? Like I mentioned a couple slides ago, data mining is a bad word in, in economics. I didn't know that when I joined the business school, and I signed up to teach a course on data mining. And I learned that uh, uh, it's a bit of a dirty word. Okay? Um, that's because when you talk about discovery of patterns in high dimensions, that's easy to do. right? I can look at anything high dimensional and draw a line through some things and then say that there's something there. right? So that's not data mining. Okay? So I had to kind of, to me, that was not data mining. And I had to narrow and I had to say, OK, well, what I do is not data mining, I guess. It's good data mining. Okay? <laughs> and, and good data mining is, is discovery okay, of these patterns, but avoiding false discovery. Okay? So good data mining is on constant guard against false discovery. Okay? I don't know if people are familiar with that term. If you've heard the term false discovery before, you probably have. False discovery is synonymous with or, or will cause, I guess is the, probably a better way of saying it, overfit. Okay? When you have false discovery or overfit in a data mining model, or any statistics model for that matter, what you're doing is you're modeling idiosyncratic noise, and the resulting predictor, whether this is a predictor for treatment, those sorts of things, or just predictor in general, whatever you want to predict with this model, your predictor is going to do very poorly on new data. In other words, when you overfit, when you have false discovery, your model is not portable. You can't pick it up from the little unique data set that you worked with and move it over to a new setting okay, and have it work. It only works on this narrow little cherry pick setting that you've, you've fit it to. Okay? So the, you, the, the search for patterns without false discovery, the search for real, useful, patterns, true patterns, we might even want to call them, is called model building. Right. Now in linear models, which I think everybody's familiar with, but I got a slide just in case, um, this is a question of variable selection. Okay? So the idea of model building, obviously I can choose a bunch of things. My, my functional form, whether I want to use factors, you know, some other crazy things. But for us today, we're going to focus on linear models which means we're going to focus on variable selection. Okay? So we're going to talk about things where you have an x times beta in there. And as you guys know, that's far less limiting than it might initially seem because your x can include some crazy expansion of a bunch of different variables that you're interested in. You can have time trends in there. You can have things interacting with each other. You can have x squared and x cubed and all this sort of stuff. Okay? So this is less limiting than it might at first seem. So here's everything that you need to know about linear models for today. 
As I mentioned, I believe everybody here is familiar with linear models, but maybe you don't know the lingo the way I use the lingo. Okay? Um, a linear model is always just expected value of y given x is some link on x times beta. Okay? It's always what it is. The Gaussian linear model, the one that you guys fit with least squares, like uh, seven days a week, is um, y is distributed as normal. Okay, around a mean that's written as a linear function of x, x times beta, with some variance sigma squared. Okay, obviously there's departures from this, and you can have sigma squared and all this sort of fun stuff depend upon x, but this is the basic linear regression model. The binomial or logistic regression model okay, is the probability that y is equal to 1, which is of course the expected value of y when y is a binary variable. The probability that y is equal to 1 is e to the e to x beta over top of 1 plus e to the x beta. It's just the logistic link function. And then the last one, um, we won't actually talk about this, but this is something that comes up a lot in data mining, so it's just good to remind yourself that there's more models out there than linear and logistic, uh, is a Poisson or a log count model. Okay? This guy comes out all the time because often when you're data mining, you're modeling counts of stuff number of clicks on a website, counts on a, uh, counts or a word, things like that. And that's just the expected value of y is equal to the variance of y, which is the exponentiated x times beta. Okay, so those are our linear models. We're going to talk about the first two of them today, and I'm really not going to explain much more about them. Um, the way that we estimate beta is commonly through maximum likelihood. Okay, so your M estimator, you're maximizing things, and the thing that you're maximizing uh, is likelihood. Uh, as a statistician, as an engineer, I much prefer to minimize things. So what we do is we multiply it by negative minus 2 and take the log, and we minimize the deviance. Okay? So here are those two terms, because those are key terms. We'll be messing around with those a, few, a bunch today. The likelihood is just the probability of what happened. Okay? given a model. So if I have a, a uh, uh, coin toss, right, and let's say my model is that it's a fair coin, so it's a 50-50, well then the likelihood when I flip the coin once is one half. The likelihood when I flip the coin twice is one half times one half is 0.25. Okay, and on and on and on. The deviance is minus two times the log likelihood. Okay, so that's, that's all there is to it. What we're doing is we're making it negative Right? So it's something that we can minimize. And we're taking the log of it so that it lives on an additive scale, right? so that when you add an observation, instead of getting multiplied in, it gets added in. Okay? So minus and log. Theoretically speaking, it's, also, it's actually two times log of the saturated likelihood. Okay? So the likelihood for a model where you have as many parameters as you have observations. Okay? For linear and logistic regression, that saturated likelihood is zero, so it disappears. For Poisson regression, it's not zero, so um, it pops up, but we can ignore it for today. So for today, you can just think about the deviance as minus two times the log likelihood. And if likelihood measures how well our data, or sorry, how well our model fits the data, think of deviance as a distance. It's the distance between the model that we have and the data that we've observed. Fit is summarized by R squareds, and there's no kind of clear definition of R squareds in general, but here's the one that I'm going to use. R squared is 1 minus the deviance of your fitted model divided by the deviance of the null model, the model where all of your betas are set to zero. For a linear model, deviance is just the sum of squares, so this is your standard R squared. For the logistic regression model, it's not the sum of squares, it's the binomial deviance, but the idea is exactly the same. Okay, R squared is the proportion of deviance explained by beta hat, by your fitted model. So that's what's going on there. And a, a statement that might come as a little bit of a surprise to you guys is that in data mining, the only R squared we really care about that actually matters to us is out of sample R squared. Okay? And so now I'm going to explain what out of sample R squared means via an example and uh, uh, hopefully this will motivate much of the other stuff that I'm going to be talking about. So here's, here's a non-economics example. I passed this by Jesse and Matt because I said, can I use engineering examples? Um, I won't get egged. And they said, no, yeah, you, totally, you can. So if, you're, if you get annoyed, just talk to them. 
Um, so this is about making semiconductor chips. It's actually a really common data set that people in machine learning use because it was made public by one of the big uh, uh, semiconductor companies uh, years ago, and so it's been a nice teaching data set that people use. Um, so what it is is uh, uh, information on 200 diagnostic signals about a chip while it's being made. And to back it up a sec, let's just make sure we all understand what's going on here. Okay, what we're doing is we're making the tiny little processors, the little silicon chips that go inside our phone or computer or whatever. Okay, this process is very, very difficult. Okay, it's one of the things that, you know, is still kind of a, a high value added manufacturing process that people out in the Bay uh, uh, spend a lot of time trying to do right. It's complicated, there's little margin for error, okay? And it's also not something where you can just get in there and look at the chip and say, hey, it's a good chip or it's a bad chip, right? So you gotta go through some pretty extensive testing to figure out whether one's good or whether it's bad. And that testing is expensive and it takes time, et cetera. So what they have is while the chip is being made, they have a bunch of kind of feedbacks on, hey, when I shot this thing or when I put this thing together, this is the sort of resistance I got or this is, was the reflectivity of this that I got, right? Bunch of sort of automatic uh, diagnostics that track the process of the chip being made. And we have about 200 here. And we have this data set, which is uh, uh, about 1,500 chips. And 100 of those were bad chips and 1,400 of those were good chips. And the idea is, hey, can we figure out a way to narrow these diagnostics, to predict failure of the chip from these diagnostics, so we can come up with some sort of bell and whistle for the engineer, the people who are watching the chip manufacturing process to look at and say, hey, this looks like a bad chip. It's gonna be worth our time to go and test it out and actually look at it in detail, okay? Um, so the model that we would use here is a logistic regression model. The probability that my chip fails is some function of x, and in particular, I'm going to use the logit link on x times beta. Okay, so logit regression here, that's what we're doing. Um, something I'll mention, because it comes up later, these xij inputs are actually orthogonal from each other, or independent. They're, they're in sample independent from each other. And that's because they're principal components from a larger set. If you know what that means, you'll know what that means. If you don't, we'll cover it later on, okay? But these X's are independent signals about the chip. So let's do an experiment to explain and illustrate what I mean by in-sample versus out-of-sample R-squared. So the in-sample R-squared, in other words, the thing that when we fit this model that I had on the previous page by maximum uh, likelihood or by minimum, minimum deviance, the thing that, that uh, uh, beta hat was fit to maximize, it's about 56% for the full regression model. Okay, so if I throw in all 200 uh, signals, okay, and my 1500 observations, I get about 56% R squared. Now go back here, I have only 100 of 1500 failures, right, which means that for 200 signals, okay, I have one observation of a failure for every two signals, okay? So it's not just that N is small here, it's that the signal amongst N that we're trying to measure is very, very rare, okay? Or relatively rare. So this model we might suspect is overfit. So since we suspect it's overfit, we might try and fit a more limited model. And an ad hoc thing that you could do is just take the 25 signals that are most highly correlated, absolute correlation with the response of interest, okay? I can look at just, you know, ranked correlations because these X's are independent, okay? So how correlated it is, it's a measure of how much it's going to influence the model fit. So I did that. I took the top 25 signals of highest absolute correlation, and uh, the R squared for this model was 0.24, okay? So it's less than half, okay? 24%. Still pretty good. 25 signals, 24%. So how do we evaluate which is the correct model? Okay, or how do we test how these models would do out of sample? Here's the following experiment. What we're going to do is we're going to split the data into 10 random subsets. Folds is what we call them in the business. I'll describe why that is later. And 10 times what we do is we take one of those subsets out, okay, and we fit the model on the left out 90% of data, and then we predict on the left out subset. 
Okay, we're going to do that 10 times in a row. And what we're going to record is the R squared for the model fit on the training data on the left out subset. And recall R squared here for logistic regression. It's going to be 1 minus the deviance of the fitted model over top of the deviance of the null model. The null model here is just Y bar. These out of sample or OOS R squareds give us a sense of how well each model can predict data that it has not already seen. And here's what you get. Here is our out of sample R squared. And I like this example because it, it uh, forces you to realize that R squared does not need to live between zero and one. Okay, what we have here are, it's actually, it's, it's the full model here does so badly it becomes hard to see what the cut model is actually doing. So I'll tell you what the cut model has. The cut model is concentrated around 10 or 12 percent R squared, okay? So it's tightly around there. The cut model is explaining about 10% of the out of sample variation. Okay, so that's that. Now the full model, what is this box over here? This is a box plot of these out of sample R squareds. There's 10 of them. What is the full model doing? Well, it's got negative R squareds. How do you get a negative R squared? Let's go back to the equation. Well, that's going to be if the deviance for your fitted model is greater than the deviance for your null model. In other words, if we're doing worse than Y bar, Okay, so the variability of the residuals, if you want to think about a linear model, the variability of the residuals for our fit, okay, is massively bigger, like 50 times bigger, or no, 10 to 15 times bigger, than the variability of the residuals when you just use Y bar as a predictor. Okay, to the engineers, this would mean, hey, okay, instead of using all of these 200 signals, just throw out every 15th chip, just toss it. Okay, regardless, doesn't matter what it looks like, just toss it. That will be better quality control than using all 200 signals. Okay? Um, this is a little bit of an extreme example, which is why I like it, but negative R squareds are actually super common. Okay? They're very, very common. You should go back and just so that you're the first person that catches it, look at some of the complicated models you fit and see how they do out of sample and maybe don't be super surprised if you do worse than Y bar. Okay? It's not something to be embarrassed about, it happens. Um, so the cut model, like I said, has an out of sample R squared of about 12%, which is about half its in sample R squared. So even for that simpler model, which I don't think is super overfit, although we'll see later on maybe it is, um, out of sample R squared is lower than in sample R squared. So how do we avoid false discovery? How do we avoid overfit? Okay, so I've told you the game now. The game is we're going to try and, <clears throat> sorry, we're going to try and discover patterns and we're going to try and do it in such a way that we don't get those big negative R squares so that we don't get overfit. The standard tool that everybody here knows for avoiding overfit is called hypothesis testing. Okay, I probably don't need to tell people about it. Chances are there's many people in this room who know more about hypothesis testing than I do. Um, but I'm going to go through a couple examples from the beginning just so we can fit it into the framework of what we're doing. Okay, so hypothesis testing, let's recall how it works. It is an inherently one at a time procedure, which gives you a bit of foreshadowing as to what we're going to need to correct for. Um, and what you get is the p value. And a p value is the probability of seeing a test statistic farther into the distribution tail than what you observe, okay, the null distribution tail. Okay, so something that looks more rare under the null hypothesis than what you've calculated. And the testing procedure, this one at a time hypothesis testing procedure, is you choose a cutoff. This cutoff is always called alpha uh, for your p-value, which is called p, confusingly, given dimension. Um, and then you conclude significance. In other words, variable association, some sort of pattern, a beta not equal to zero, for any p that is less than this cutoff alpha. Okay, that's how hypothesis testing works. Um, the reason that this works, the way that this is justified, is if you follow this rule, your risk of a false positive, the risk of concluding that there is variable association when there was not, the risk of concluding that the null is false when the null was actually true, is less than alpha. Okay, so alpha is like an upper bound on your false positive probability. So, um, in practice, what you do, well, in practice, what everybody does is they just choose alpha equal 0.05. But theoretically, in practice, what you should be doing is having some sort of acceptable risk of a false discovery that you, through, I don't know, some magic, have, have magic cost function have dreamed up. 
and then you're going to only conclude, say, for example, in regression that a beta is not equal to zero uh, if its p-value is smaller than this acceptable risk of a false positive. Okay? That's the mechanics of it. The example that I'm going to run through to, to talk about how these mechanics work in high dimensions, we're going to look at some contingency tables. Okay? So the idea of a contingency table, um, I probably don't need, this is the first thing everybody learns in stats, but we'll, we'll go through it very quickly. The idea and analysis of a contingency table is we want to know if the factors on the rows and the columns are correlated with each other. So here's an example from the NORC. Uh, it's an old one, 1998. Is belief in an afterlife gender dependent? Okay, so these guys ask everything about all sorts of opinions and then we want to know, hey, does this matter here? So this tabulates a cross classification. If the factors are independent, which is going to be our null hypothesis, then any level of one should have the same probability for each level of the other factor. Okay, so in other words, the cell counts across dimensions should be independent from each other. How does this work as a test statistic? Well, you use that assumption, and then you say, given that assumption, here's something that I know the distribution for, given that assumption. Okay? Well, consider a table like this. Here's how the test statistic works. What you do is you look at the difference between the actual cell counts, okay? So my uh, 509 females who believe in an afterlife, actual cell count, minus expected cell counts. I'll tell you what that is in a second. Squared divided by the expected cell count. You sum that all up, and you know the distribution on that thing, okay? Expected cell count here is the row total um, times the column total divided by n. You could just think of this as the, the uh, row proportion female times the column proportion belief in afterlife divided by total. So it's the expected count if those two factors were independent. Um, this thing, if they are independent, has something called a chi-squared distribution, which everybody knows and loves, and it has a certain number of degrees of freedom. Okay? In this case, it has one degree of freedom. This is the basic formula. Stata, I think, does a correction of some sort. So does MATLAB, whatever, but this is the standard formula. So here's how it looks for our table over here. I've added up all of those things. This is the exercise. The Z value that we get back, the chi-squared value that we get back is 0.8. We look at the distribution of null hypothesis Z values, what we would expect to get if the factors were actually independent. And you see that we have a, a uh, that, that our Z, the blue line up there, falls right in the fat bit, so it doesn't look that rare. And alpha equal 0.05 cutoff is out on the other end there at the 95th quantile. Um, so what we would say is, hey, there's no evidence of, of association between gender and afterlife beliefs. Okay, that's the way hypothesis testing works. Now the problems. Okay, the problems I think everybody here is probably fairly familiar with. Um, the problem is that this is alpha for a single test. Okay? If you repeat many tests, then what happens is alpha times 100% of the null test should erroneously pop up as significant. Okay? So if I test 20 times, I should expect on average one of those things that comes up as uh, 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 one thing to come up every 20 tests just randomly, spuriously, by chance. Okay? This is something that people are familiar with. Often they haven't internalized how big a deal that can be when you're working with rare signals. Okay? And so I'll describe what I mean by rare signal here. Let's imagine, actually it's not even that rare, but let's imagine that we have 100 regression coefficients and 5 out of 100 of them actually matter. Okay? So I, I am all seeing and I know that 5 of my 100 coefficients actually matter and 95 of them are, are junk. Okay? And let's be super generous to me, the statistician. Let's say that I find all five. So for all of those five, my p-values are super tiny, and I have my cutoff, and I reject, and I've, I've managed to nail the five signals. Okay? So these are like five strong signals, I'm assuming. Now, of the other 95 signals out there, 5% okay, of those are going to pop up as significant if I test at the alpha equal 0.05 level, okay? which means that spuriously about 4.75, or let's just say five of those junk covariates are going to be included in the model if I do a hypothesis testing type thing. Which means that in the total, what I'm going to have is five coefficients that are true. 
okay? Five coefficients that are useful that actually matter, okay? Out of a total of five true plus five null coefficients that I've included in my model. To put this another way, half of the stuff that I'm putting in my regression model is pure junk, okay? And why is junk bad? Well, it's going to make our model overfit and it's gonna make our model less portable and it's gonna give us negative R squareds, right? Because all that junk does is it adds to the variability of our predictions that junk is what gives you the negative out of sample, R squared, okay? So this happened because I said, hey, only five of my 100 coefficients are, significant, are actually valuable, are actually real, okay? That's how I got a high false discovery proportion here. That's what that's called. Now, 5% of coefficients actually mattering, okay? That's, that's fantastic in many data mining settings. You think about words, right? So you have a million words, something like that, and you want to find the words that are actually correlated with some rare market movement or something like that, okay? Not going to be 5%. It's not going to be 1%. It's going to be 1 1,000th one of 1% or something like that. You're going to find a few that really pick it up. Rare event type stuff, okay? Web browsing, click-through rates. Most ads, most things that people click on don't matter. If you talk to anybody that works in digital advertising, they'll say that it's very much a needle in a haystack setting. So anytime you have a needle in a haystack that you're looking for, okay, you run into this problem where your false discovery proportions can get very, very high. Okay? So the false discovery proportion, here it is. It's the number of false positives divided by the number of tests that you've called significant. Okay? And this is what we're going to use and actually what I hope everybody here uses from now on whenever they talk about p-values. Okay? The moment you have more than one p-value, you should be talking about this rather than alpha because you're not making decisions in aggregate, or sorry, decisions independently. Whenever you're looking at a group of p-values, you're making an aggregate decision. Okay? So it's no cost to you. Conceptually, this should be the way that you're evaluating your aggregate decision. It's not a data mining thing. That's just good stats. Okay? But it's especially important when your dimension, when the number of p-values you're looking at is quite big and when you're in this rare signal setting. Okay, so your false discovery proportion is the number of false positives divided by the number of things that you call significant. It's a property of our fitted model, okay? It, it's not something we know, right? If we knew it, well, then we wouldn't have to worry about estimation because we would just know what is true and what is false, okay? But just like alpha, Okay, we can derive its expectation under some conditions. And its expectation is called the false discovery rate. Okay? And we can derive its expectation. We can use algorithms to make sure that the false discovery rate is below some upper bound, and that's called false discovery rate control. Okay? Um, when you want to understand what this is, like I said, just think of it as the multivariate analog of alpha. It's what you should be thinking about whenever you're talking about multiple p-values. So false discovery rate control. This is actually a pretty old algorithm now. It's very, very common in the biostatistics literature and the medical literature. Um, it hasn't really made a big splash in economics yet, but maybe you guys will change that. Um, but it's kind of a workhorse way to evaluate many, many p-values. Okay? And here's the way it works. I'll just describe the algorithm, then we'll talk about why it works. You rank your n p-values, capital N p-values here, from smallest to largest, okay? So whenever you put a little bracket around the subscript, that means it's now a rank statistic. So P1 is the smallest, P2 is the next smallest, all the way up to Pn is your biggest p-value. You choose a cutoff Q value, so it's no longer an alpha value, it's a Q value, where you want the false discovery rate to be less than or equal to Q. So let's say 10%, right? So I want my false discovery rate, my expected false discovery proportion to be less than 10%. You set the p-value cutoff then as a function of that q as the maximum p-value such that the p-value is less than q times its rank over the total number of p-values. Okay? I'll explain why that works in a second, but the magic is that if you do this, if you set your p-value cutoff in this way, the false discovery rate is less than or equal to q, assuming a bunch of stuff. Okay? Um, so that's the magic of it. That's why it's a very appealing algorithm. That's why it's used all the time. The weakness of it is the big assumption. Benjamin and Hochberg, they assume independence between tests, okay? Which we know is probably not true, right? In fact, it's never true. 
They assume independence between tests. Um, this condition can be weakened because this is such a nice, popular, heavily used algorithm. A lot of effort has gone into weakening this assumption, okay? So getting away with false discovery rates when you don't have independence. Um, there's a fairly old result that says if your p-values are only positively correlated under some slightly, uh, so a couple other weak assumptions, then, then this result still holds, okay? There's also a literature on replacing the independence assumptions with other modeling frameworks. So Brad Efron has kind of an empirical Bayes interpretation of these things, and Jonathan Story has a series of, of, of papers on full Bayes interpretations of these things, okay? And those have been very successful in coming up with, hey, settings where I don't have independence, but this thing still works, why is that? Okay, so you can think of these guys as answering those, that question. Um, but regardless, independence between tests, you might not have been thinking about it previously. This is an issue whenever you look at marginal p-values, okay? So unless you're like Chris over there and you're getting, you know, joint p-values on large high-dimensional sets, okay, most of us are looking at point-wise p-values, and this independence thing was lurking everywhere there whenever we did that, whether we realized it or not, but here it's explicit. So here's the motivation for false discovery rate control, okay? So remember the algorithm is we just pick the P such that the it's the maximum rank P value less than or equal to Q times its rank over top of the number of P values. Where does this come from? One, P values are uniformly distributed under the null, okay? I think everybody here should understand that and have internalized that, but that's a big point. Right? That's like the point of testing. You need to really understand that. Okay? And why is that? Well, I have the picture of justification up here. P-value is just under a null hypothesis. Okay? It's the probability of being greater than or equal to something drawn from that distribution. Okay? Sorry, greater than, yeah, greater than or equal to something drawn from that distribution. That's what we call in statistics the probability integral transform, okay? So the probability of being greater than something where that something was drawn from that same distribution is uniform, okay? That's something that everybody should know whenever they do a hypothesis test. Um, the next step, it's kind of the line below my, my um, beautiful curve thing there, which is that rank statistics from a uniform have expectation K over N. Okay, so the rank statistic function for a uniform distribution is a straight line. That shouldn't be too hard to convince yourself of. If you want to just simulate from a uniform and plot their ranks, you'll see pretty quickly. Okay? What that means is, if all of the p-values came from the null distribution, we would expect that they should line up when ranked on this kind of straight line. Okay? So what false discovery rate does geometrically is it says how far below this expected straight line do your p-values have to drop before I get to call them significant. Okay, that's the geometrically what's going into it. How does that actually work? Okay, um, here's the proof. The proof is eminently simple if you assume independence. Uh, the people who have tried to relax independence have put a lot more work into proving this. Um, but if you assume independence, it's really, really easy. Um, let's just say that R of U is the total uh, uh, number of p-values less than or equal to some U. So U is a uniform probability. It's just p between 0 and 1. And if we choose a certain p between 0 and 1 or U between 0 and 1, okay, then there's going to be a number of p-values below that point. Okay, and those are going to be the ones that we call significant. Another way to rewrite the Benjamini and Hochberg cutoff is just that u star, that p star is the maximum u, such that u is less than or equal to q times the number of p values at that point divided by n. Okay? If you want to convince yourself of that, just think about what it would be for p. Okay? So if u was pi, our max pi, then u would be pi there, and r, the number of p values less than that point, would be its rank, i. So it's just pi less than or equal to q times i over n. So what that means is that we have one over the number of p-values at any cutoff point is less than or equal to q divided by n times that cutoff point. And our false discovery rate, if we say that uh, uh, r, little r of u star is the, uh, uh, the number of null 
less than that cutoff point. Our false discovery rate is the number of null less than that cutoff point divided by the total number less than that cutoff point, which from my little derivation above there, we can write as Q times the number null less than that cutoff point divided by N times U, okay? And then R U over U always has expectation N naught, okay? It always has expectation number of null P values uh, in your whole sample, okay? And that's where the independence comes in, okay? So if you want to see that the number of null P values less than a certain point divided by that point on a uniform, okay? Let's put this in other words. How many P values below every point from a null hypothesis divided by that point on the uniform distribution do I expect to be, uh, uh, do I, do I expect to find what is the expectation of that ratio? It's always n naught, the total number of p-values in your uh, uh, in your sample. Okay, and to see that you just need to scribble it out. But all you have to do is you have to do it for one, right? And the the expectation of this, this thing is the probability of a null p-value. You do it for two. If they're independent, it's the probability of one null plus the probability of another null. You do it for three. You add them all up. You get the number null. Okay, so there, that's there for you if you want to go and do it yourself. Oh, sorry, I forgot the punchline. The punchline is when you replace that little ratio with n naught, then your false discovery proportion has expectation q times the number null divided by the total number n. Okay, the number null can't be less or can't be greater than the total number of p-values, which means that your false discovery rate is less than or equal to the, uh, um, less than or equal to q. This last point actually here, it's worth mentioning. The bound, even though it's not usually mentioned this way, is actually Q times the number null divided by the total number N. Okay, so as you have fewer null in your sample, your false discovery uh, rate is, is bounded by a lower and lower number. <laughs> However, since you never know the number null, you, you don't get to leverage that in any way. So here's an example of false discovery rate control. This is one of its, its, uh, its settings. This is where false discovery rate control lives, and that's in genetics, okay? So it's very popular. It's, it's used less and less these days because of the independence assumption, but it's still a bread and butter method. Um, we're gonna look at a GWAS example. So GWAS means genome-wide association study. Okay, and these guys are pretty common. Um, what we do is kind of given the fact that we have some understanding of what changes in the genome and how that might affect biology, but not a great understanding of the mechanisms, there's these big data mining exercises that go on, which is where you take the entire uh, uh, large set of locations on the genome, on the DNA or whatever, and you look at how expression at those locations changing amongst individuals uh, correlates with phenotypes, with characteristics of the individuals. Whether or not they have uh, uh, diabetes is gonna be the one that we look at. Okay. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, is what everybody calls them, are just locations where things change between individuals, okay? We don't look at the entire genome because most of us share basically everything, okay? So there's a few locations that actually change between people, and that's what people look at when they're doing these types of studies. They narrow it down to those few locations. And then you ask the question very often, at these locations, what changes depending upon some other thing that I'm interested in? And the thing that we're going to look at changing today is frequency of the minor allele, minor and major allele, right? So you have big A and little a at each location major allele and minor allele, and you have one of each, and you can either have big A and big A, little a and little a, or little a and big A, or big A and little a, okay? So here's how that summary works here. Um, a common way of aggregating these things is just to count the minor allele frequency. That's MAF. So if you ever see MAF and SNP, you guys now know what that means. Um, big A and little a, uh, um, Sorry, we're counting the number of little a's. Okay, so two major alleles is zero, major and minor is one, two minor alleles is two. And the question that's asked here is which minor allele frequency distributions vary with disease status? So in other words, if we see a location and this person has a high expression, a, an extra minor allele here, okay? 
well, then maybe we should monitor them for diabetes risk, or maybe we should monitor them for this sort of uh, disease over here. That's the way the exercise goes. Um, if we want to answer that question, what we come up with is a massive number of contingency tables where you have disease status, okay, case versus control, against counts for this minor allele. Okay, so this gets back to the gender and, and belief in the actor life. Here's a more scientific version of the exact same thing. And so here's what one of these tables looks like. This is for good old SNP, RS6577, et cetera. And this is actually the most significant uh, uh, location when you compare to type 2 diabetes. So this is a big pseudo-public uh, uh, data set on, on uh, genetic information in type 2 diabetes. And what we have here, let me just, I don't think I say how many I have. I do in the next one. Um, this person, or this, sorry, this location of the people that had type 2 diabetes, 27 of them had a minor allele frequency of 2. And of the people that did not have type 2 diabetes, only one of them had a minor allele frequency of 2. This is actually a nice design experiment as well. They controlled for a bunch of other stuff. So these are pretty solid kind of results. So this is the most significant of the tables. They don't all look like that. Here are the p-values for all of the, the uh, contingency tables that we have here. The data set has about 1,000 individuals. One half of them are diabetic, okay? And that leaves us with a little bit under 8,000 SNPs. Okay? Um, 2,700 of the tables have really small cell proportions. In other words, minor alleles almost never pop up for this SNP, and we just ignore those. Okay? That, that's, we don't have a theory for what the null hypothesis is when those expected cell counts get too small. And so this is kind of a lesson, I think. I've noticed this in economics literature, people using chi-squared stuff where the cell counts are very, very small. Just don't do it. You, the null hypothesis is not a good approximation in that setting. You need other techniques. Here, instead of using other techniques, I'm just going to ignore them. Um, so, so we do that, and what that leaves us with is about 5,000 p-values, okay? And remember, rare signal, we think most genes probably don't cause diabetes, or I should be careful with cause, probably aren't super correlated with diabetes, okay? Um, we have 5,000 of them. How are we going to do something here and get a low false discovery rate? Well, what we'll do is we'll use that FDR control algorithm. And here it is visually, okay? If you want code to do this, I mean, the algorithm is eminently simple, so you can just code it up yourself in Stata. There's code to do this in R on my website, but it's very easy. Um, what we do is we find the cutoff, the maximum p-value, whose, whose uh, p-value is less than q times its rank over n, okay? This actually looks like a line through the rank p-values with slope q over n, right? Through the ranks. Okay, the line i times q over n okay, is, a, is a line through i with slope q over n. So that's what I've plotted here. Everything that lives below that line is significant, okay, past the soup point below that line is significant. And everything above that line is called insignificant. So the red here are significant, the gray here are insignificant. And so this is the way it works. You get a plot of your p-values like this, you look at them in aggregate, you choose some cutoff, okay? And then given that cutoff, you know the false discovery rate properties of your, of your test. Okay, so actually here we had a ton of action. Okay, so 183 significant p-values, even at an FDR of, of 0 0.001, okay, 0001. That's pretty rare. This was a big study, randomized control experiments. These things were actually, and these were targeted p-values. These were places doctors wanted to look for biological reasons. Okay? This is quite rare. Most often in GWAS stuff, you don't see anything this nice. Uh, in the social science-ish literature, Jesse pointed this out to me, there's this Chabriz et, et al. paper in psych science from this year. They looked at a meta-study of all of the GWAS, or sorry, a GWAS meta-study of all of the genetic locations that had been found to be correlated with measures of intelligence, IQ type stuff. Okay, and they found, I think there was 14 that had really become stylized facts or at least accepted and published and big in the literature. They looked at 14, these 14 things in a meta study where they got three new data sets and tested for each in those three new data sets. Okay, of those three new data set tests of those three or of those 14 locations, one popped up significant. Okay, 
so when you control for everything, right? Which means that one, and even that means that it came up only one out of three times. Okay, so basically none of the things that were found to be significant were. Um, so that's why you have to be careful whenever you're working in high dimension. Okay, so check out that paper. It's a great example of false discovery rate, power calculations, things like that. Here we are back to the semiconductors that I talked about. Okay, so remember our semiconductors. Here's what the p-values look like for those guys. Um, some of them are clustered right down around zero. The rest sprawl all of the way out to one. Um, the question is, which of these come from a null hypothesis and which are significant? There's actually something to point out. <coughs> Plotting your p-values is not a bad idea because it gives you some intuition. If I plotted these and there was no spike down next to zero, it would probably be time to break for lunch, right? So if you plot that and you see something with just a flat, uniform distribution of p-values, it looks like your p-values all came from the null. Either you have nothing to discover or you shouldn't be using p-values. Okay? In this case, we don't have that. It looks like we do have a little bit of a mode going up towards, one, uh, towards zero. So it looks like we do have some uh, significant uh, significant val values here. How do we choose that cutoff? Well, we can do FDR. The FDR Q equal 0.1 line gives me 25 values, okay? Because the X inputs are independent, these are actually the 25 values that I came up with for the first slide, okay? So these were the 25 that I used when I cut it down to 25, okay? So because the Xs are independent, the correlation and the p-value is basically the same thing here. Um, there is not really an industry standard on what Q to use. Okay? The closest thing we have is 0 0.1. Okay? But for the same reason that people shrug their shoulders whenever they ask why alpha equal 0.05, it's the same thing with why Q equal 0.1, just seems to be the consensus that people use. But there's no, there's no real reason. So now, the problems with false discovery rate control. Um, a big problem and the problem that we highlighted from the very beginning is dependence. Okay? That's the issue and that's the issue whenever you use marginal p-values. Okay? I can't emphasize that enough. If all of your x's are super highly correlated with each other, you don't have say 10 p-values, you have one, right? And you don't know its distribution because they're all correlated with each other. Okay? So, so this is an issue whenever you test but here it's explicit. Um, here in these tests, FDR is okay because the things that we're evaluating are plausibly independent. I use plausibly in kind of a sketchy sense there. Um, the SNPs were far apart. They were chosen to be far apart. They chose a location and they targeted there. The principal components are orthogonal in the semiconductors example. However, you won't usually have this. And in fact, we don't have independence here, right? Clearly genes are related even if I chose them to be far apart. And my semiconductor signals, my factors are orthogonal in sample, but those are estimated, so their sampling distribution is correlated. The absolute values are negatively correlated. So dependence is always going to be an issue. Of particular issue for everybody in this room is multicollinearity. When you're doing regression and your x's are correlated with each other, what this tends to do is inflate your p-values. Right? It can work in other nefarious ways, but what it will tend to do is inflate your p-values, which means that you end up with, uh, instead of a picture that looks like this with the spike down at zero, you'll get a picture with the spike up at one because you'll get some really big p-values. And well, what that means is that, hey, I have collinearity. I have two signals that do the exact same thing. Okay? I have two, I don't know, say I've measured the size of your house in meters and I've measured the size of your house in feet. Okay? Well, the p-value on those is going to be very, very big because we don't know whether one needs to be set to zero and the other given its MLE, or the other one set to zero and the other given its MLE. Okay? So if you have two that are highly correlated, they both get high p-values, which means that anything based on marginal p-values is going to miss both of them. Okay? Now, chances are in a rare signal environment, the thing you're looking for is correlated with a bunch of other stuff because it's important and you're looking for it. Right? which means that you're probably going to miss the few things that you very much care about uh, in multicollinearity based settings when you're working with p-values. Even with independence though, even ignoring this independence assumption, which is by far the worst thing that we have to deal with, um, FDR control is often impractical. Okay? 
one of these reasons is that you're regressing, I'll start with the second reason. P values only exist for P less than N, right? I mean, there's ways to get modeled P values when you have more observations and you have dimensions of your model, but that's, that's pretty tough business, okay? So in a lot of the settings that we're looking at and that you guys will be looking at, you could have P greater than N. Certainly in genetics, they often have like 12 individuals and 8,000 genes, which makes you question a little bit what they're doing sometimes. I forgot I'm on video. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, but, so that's one problem, okay? And for P anywhere near to N, okay, even if you don't have P greater than N, even if you have P like one half N, you're working with very few degrees of freedom in the full model, okay? Which gets back to the other point, all of these, the first bullet there, all of these P values are being calculated conditional on everybody else being in the model, conditional on all of the other X's being in the model, okay? For the reasons I just described with P close to N, that's probably a terrible model, which means you're basing everything on calculations based upon a probably terrible model. Nobody would start with the full model in most data mining scenarios. So that's the reason that beyond dependence that p-values are, are, are tough to do, work with and why FDR can fail. However, if you are tied to p-values, if you don't have any other choice, if you're in a forest and, and you, know, you don't have any data and somebody just gives you a p-value, false discovery rate is the best thing you can do. Okay, so that's testing with p-values. Um, that's a bit of a natural break. So just to kind of rehash what we did there, um, I brought you up into how do we do testing in high dimensions, and I kind of brought it crashing down a little bit. Actually, it started out down because we discussed the assumption of independence and how that's going to be tough to satisfy and how that's going to get in the way uh, of false discovery rate control being a, me a, a method that we can use in practice. So now we're going to talk about different ways that we can use to evaluate and select models amongst a bunch of high dimensional covariates. Okay? And that is really the core, this is the bread and butter, so this next section between now and to lunch is really the core of what goes on day to day in modern data mining. This is the, the we're going to talk about things like the lasso and penalized estimation and cross validation and that's going to be the the, the real meat of what you guys are going to need to know if you want to try and work at this scale. So the first thing that we need to, let me get rid of this guy. The first thing that we're going to talk about are different ways to evaluate models. You recall that when I started out, I said, hey, here's some ways, some metrics that we're going to use to say whether one model is better than or worse than another model. And the one that we started out with was false discovery. Okay. False proportion, proportion of false discoveries, etc. That was just one. The other metrics that I mentioned were both very closely related to prediction. Okay. So what is the difference between discovery or hypothesis testing and a prediction or prediction evaluation type of, of, of model building process? So hypothesis testing is all about evidence. What can we conclude? Okay. Often, that's not quite the question you're asking. So the what can we conclude question, it's like your, your data is on trial. It's like you are on trial, right? And, and all of your conclusions are null until proven significant, okay? And that's the way you work because you really don't want to say something that's invalid, okay? Now, that's a great way when you're talking about one special parameter that you have a stylistic interpretation for that you're going to go start like changing interest rates based upon and like you want to make sure it doesn't plunge the world into recession. Um, that's great for that one parameter. For everything else out there, all of those thousands of other parameters that you're trying to get a pretty good model for, okay, you don't want to put each of those individuals on trial. You just want a good sense of how they work in a predictive model for predicting the things you know. To put this another way, like I said, I'm an engineer. Let's imagine that people designed planes and automobiles just by hypothesis testing, okay? The only people here would be people that walked here, right? None of us would be here from out of town. Um, 
So, so false discovery rate control is a very valid way to evaluate appropriateness of a model. However, it's overused because it's not always the key to what you want out of a model and it's often far too cautious. Okay? And in many settings, being cautious is not even conservative, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll see what that means. So false discovery proportions, just one possible model metric. An alternative is predictive performance and this is usually easier to measure. Okay, for one, so that makes it nice in high dimensions. Two, it's going to be more suited to the application at hand often. And that's even true in causal inference because let's go back to the very beginning and what Chris and Victor are going to talk about tomorrow. When you want to control for many variables in, say, a treatment effect setting, the whole enterprise works on predicting treatment you know, the, whether or not somebody had a treatment applied to them from your exes, and predicting response whether or not they clicked on an ad, say for example, from all of the X's, doing a good job of predicting those two things, and then looking at the, I don't know, say the residuals or the correlation and the residuals left over between those two predictions and interpreting that causally. So all of these causal exercises boil down to really good prediction at very high dimensions, and then at the very end, a hypothesis testing evidence-based type evaluation for one parameter or two parameters, some low dimensional thing that you really want to tell a story about. Okay, so prediction is king. So here's my prediction-based model building recipe. Okay, the way that we're going to do things is, one, find a manageable set of candidate models. Okay. What do I mean by manageable? I mean that you can fit all models in your set pretty quickly. Okay. And what does pretty quickly mean? Well, it's how much time you have and that depends upon how much you value your time. Um, so, 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 so fast. Um, once we have this set of candidate models and we can fit all of them in a reasonable amount of time, then we're going to choose amongst these candidates the one with best predictive performance on unseen data. Okay. So one, it's actually hard, but we'll discuss how it's done. So coming up with sets of good candidate models that can be fit, qu fit quickly, that is the lasso and related methods. So we're going to talk about how that's done. Two, seems flat out impossible. How am I going to predict how well a model can do or evaluate how well a model will do on predicting that it, data that it has not seen? Okay. Um, it's not impossible. Uh, like many things that seem impossible in statistics, we're going to estimate it and come up with ways to estimate this thing. So before we do that though, we're going to have to basically decide upon or devise a couple metrics of model performance, of predictive ability, uh, and then we'll come up with estimators for those things. Okay, so when we're talking about item two here, which is evaluating how well our model does on predicting data it has not seen, there are two ways of evaluating how well in that scenario. The first is the classic crystal ball. And I think um, this is old terminology. I think Bryman popularized the crystal ball terminology. What is the error rate for a given model fitting routine? Okay, so we're not talking about a model, but a way of estimating a model on data on new observations from the same data generating process as my data. Okay, so we're assuming X and Y are coming from the same distribution that generated my X and Y. What is the out of sample error rate of my model on that new data? And then the other one is the Bayesian way of thinking about these things. What is the posterior probability of a given model? For those of you that aren't familiar with Bayes in, like, I don't know, three sentences, your, your parameters are random variables. You have a prior distribution over the value of those parameters, those random variables, before you see data. After you see data, you have a posterior, an updated uncertainty distribution for those variables. Um, the point of it is, is that it's a theoretical framework for motivating a lot of the ways that we'll talk about model evaluation, so we're going to need it a little bit. Um, so the Bayesian asks, what is the posterior probability? In other words, what is the probability that the data came from this model? Okay. These might seem as though they're different, but mechanically they're actually very closely linked. Uh, because posteriors are integrated likelihoods, a likelihood is the probability of the data. Okay? And integrating over parameter uncertainty means, hey, how likely or how predictable was this data given 
any of the possible values I could have estimated for the parameters, okay? Over, averaging over all the possible values. So they're actually very closely linked um, for some nice deep reasons, but we'll see that in practice they also end up being giving the same results. Um, crystal ball performance, though, let's start with that. Crystal ball performance is something that we can estimate through cross-validation. Now, we already did that. You remember when we started out, this was where I convinced you that you need to do, uh, uh, you need to control for false discovery. When we had the out of sample testing for the semiconductor values and on your left out 10% of data, you got a negative R squared. Okay, that was an out of sample prediction experiment and implicitly in that experiment, we were estimating crystal ball type uncertainty. Right, so the uncertainty as to how well is my model fitting procedure going to do, in that case, maximum likelihood on all of the parameters versus maximum likelihood on 25 chosen parameters. And the question was, how well do those two possible model fitting procedures do at predicting left out observations? Okay? And that's the way that we'll evaluate and measure and attempt to, to estimate out of sample predict, uh, crystal ball Predictive, uh, uh, predictive uncertainty. Okay? So the process of using these out of sample or OOS experiments, and it's always OOS in quotes because of course you can only, you can't actually predict data you have not seen. So, um, so it's kind of a, a stylized little experiment. The process of using these experiments in order to choose a model is called cross-validation. Probably a term that many people have heard before. There it is rigorously, that's all it is. You split your data up into a bunch of little chunks. You see how well your candidate models predict when fit on some of the data, on the left out data, and you choose the model that is best upon some measure at doing that, at predicting the left out data. That's called cross-validation, okay? Um, how do we measure performance out of sample? It depends upon the problem that you're working with. If you are working in a vacuum, you don't really know, you know, you're just trying to get a good model, then deviance is probably gonna be what you want to evaluate out of sample. Deviance is what you minimize when you fit the model. So presumably deviance is a good measure of distance between model and data, and it's a good measure of what you're trying to do. In other settings though, you might have different out of sample metrics. For example, people often work with misclassification rates for classification, um, area underneath the ROC curve. So if you wanna have kind of a, a, the receiver operating characteristic curve, so how sensitive versus specific can I make my test? Error quantiles, right? So people in finance will cross validate uh, uh, high risk events rather than looking at how well it does on average, which is what the deviance measures. And the last thing I'll say here, because it'll come up again when we look, you care about both the average and the spread of out of sample error. Okay, so a model who has massively wide, so it can do very, very well out of sample or it can do absolutely terribly out of sample, but on average it has, a, I don't know, an R squared of 10% out of sample. That is not as good as a model that has an average R squared of about 10% and is ranges between 11% and 9%. Now it's not gonna be the, the same, so often you'll have to make some decision. We'll talk about how that's done. Uh, the lingo here, when I talked about those left out samples in cross-validation, I called them folds. Okay, so a fold is as follows. What you do is you take the pieces of, you take your data in advance and you split it up into, if you're doing 10 fold cross-validation, 10 pieces. Okay? And you use those pieces, those pieces that are fixed in advance, as your left out validation sample. So you go through, like I said already, you're going to take, leave out that first 10%, you're going to fit the model on the 90%, and you're going to predict on that left out 10. Then you put that 10% back in, and you take out the next 10%, you fit to this 90% of data, and you predict on the game that left out 10%. Okay? This is as opposed to the naive cross-validation procedure, which would just be 10 times I draw a random sample of size 10% of my data and predict on that as the left out data, okay? The difference is, is that here we're making sure 
that each observation is left out exactly once, whereas if you were just running this and drawing random samples each time, you're not guaranteed that each observation is left out exactly once. It's just a way to lower the variability of the method, and it's a Monte Carlo method, so you inevitably want to lower the variability of this method. Okay, so that's k-fold cross-validation, k or n, depending upon who's talking. Um, one very popular, theoretically, uh, way of doing cross-validation is n-fold or n, little n-fold, or leave one out cross-validation. It's where the size of your left out sample fold is one. So you repeatedly go through the data, you take one observation out, you fit uh, on, on n minus one observations and you see how well you predict the left out one. Then you do it over and over and over again. Okay? This is nice for a couple reasons. One, it is for a fixed data set, non-random. Okay? So you've gotten rid of that Monte Carlo variation, right? So your result is going to be the same every time. Um, and it's, you know, the sample size of your left out, uh, or sorry, the sample size of your training samples are as close as possible to your actual sample size, which is nice for replicating performance of the model that you're actually going to fit. However, it takes too long in most settings. So, you know, you have 20,000, 60,000 observations. This is impractical. So you, often you don't do this. Generally, what you do is you choose the biggest K that you have time for. There's reasons to use large, smaller K, but basically just choose the biggest one that you're willing to wait for. Problems with cross-validation. Okay, so, so there's what it is. Here's what's wrong with it. Um, it's time consuming. Like I just said, Estimation is not instant when we're working with data mining models and fitting k times is unfeasible, uh, infeasible if, if even fitting once is expensive. And you know, if your k gets too small, the typical smallest value that people use is k equal five. That's the default on most software. I don't know if Stata does cross-validation, but if it did, it would probably use a default of five. Um, you know, and that's kind of the smallest people are willing to go, right? So you're using 80% of your data for training at each point. Um, getting smaller than that for computational reasons is probably unwise. So it's time consuming. It can be unstable. And this is actually, um, among statisticians, I think pretty well understood. But amongst practitioners of cross-validation, often not well understood. Cross-validation can have a very high sampling variance, okay? So it's a high variance technique. What do I mean by that? Imagine cross-validating cross-validation, okay? So if you had a bunch of data sets, okay, and you cross-validated on each of those data sets to choose a model, the model that you choose via cross-validation on each of those data sets can change dramatically, okay? So in other words, if you jitter your data, Cross-validation can give you very different results. Even for the leave one out procedure, where the cross-validation itself is actually uh, deterministic, even for the leave one out, if you imagine a sampling distribution for the leave one out model choice, it can change dramatically across samples. So it's unstable in that setting, especially when you combine it with unstable models, which is something we'll learn about in about 45 minutes. It's also hard not to cheat. So most of the cross-validation I see, people have cheated somehow, okay? Um, it's hard not to cheat, unless you're doing something like the last or something like that where it's designed for cross-validation. For example, we did cross-validation today with those 25 signals. How did I choose those 25 variables? I looked at my entire data set, boom, that's where I cheated, and I chose the 25 variables that were most highly correlated with the response. And then I refit maximum likelihood with just those 25 variables. Yeah, sure, I didn't use all the data. But it's not surprising that those 25 do well predicting left out stuff because I cherry picked them, right? Because I went through all of the data. I said, hey, these are the ones that matter for everything going on here. Who's to say that if I had for each little training sample chosen the 25 within that training sample that are most correlated with response, okay? Who's to say it would do as well? It probably would not have done as well. And even cherry picking them, we only had 10% out of sample R squared. So it makes me a little bit worried about uh, the quality of that model there. Still, despite these weaknesses, 
Cross-validation is seen as a pretty objective, pretty impartial judge. It's used in most data mining applications in some form. Even when it takes way too long, there will be at least one validation set that somebody will say, hey, I ran it here and I trained it on my left out observations over here. That's like one kind of uh, uh, a one-fold cross-validation type exercise. Um, alternatives to cross-validation. Okay, so we've seen cross-validation, it makes a ton of sense, it's used all the time. It does have some weaknesses, and the biggest weakness is time, okay, although Chris will talk about probably theoretical weaknesses as well. Um, there are alternatives to cross-validation. There are many of them. Uh, the biggest one, the ones that you guys are probably familiar with, are information criteria. Okay? Uh, so let's just talk about what an information criteria is, and then I'll fit it into our paradigm of models and model evaluation. So there are many information criteria out there. You guys are probably familiar with the AIC, BIC, there's DIC, TIC, there's lots of them. Um, these IC are, there are a lot of things. There's a few different ways to interpret them, I should say first of all, okay? One way that you can interpret these, in, these information criteria are as approximations to Bayesian log model probabilities. Okay, so actually minus log mo uh, model probabilities. They're on the scale of deviance. Okay, um, so approximations to posteriors for models. They're on the minus log scale, so that the lowest IC, okay, the value with the model with lowest AIC or lowest BIC, corresponds to the val to the model with highest probability, highest posterior probability. Okay, and where does that posterior probability come from? Well, you have Probably the camera guy. Uh, you have over here, uh, what is the probability of a model? Well, this is that Bayesian thing that I told you what it was, right? And for those of you who aren't Bayesians and aren't steeped in that literature, this will seem pretty sketchy. What does it mean to talk about the probability of a model given some data? What we'll do is we'll break it down. What's the probability of the data and the model? Still a little bit sketchy. Divided by the probability of the data averaged over all possible models. Okay, well, this thing here is obviously going to be pretty hard to get. Right? Um, so I do what all good Bayesians do is just ignore it. And you put a little proportional over here because this is the same for all possible models. So if we want to find the model that makes this thing as big as possible, well, then we don't need to know what this is because everything's just proportional to that. You kind of got to make sure it's not infinite, but that's about it. Um, no, you do have to make sure it's not infinite. Uh, so this thing here, just through simple probability rules, probability of two things. Is the probability of one thing given the other thing times the probability of the other thing. Okay? So now the sketchiness is isolated in this thing over here called a prior. Because this is just our likelihood, right? Likelihood should be something that people are fairly comfortable with. And what I've said is that this posterior construct over here is just proportional product of the data likelihood times the data prior. And so these model, the, these information criteria that we come up with are approximating this thing, or can be interpreted as approximating this thing. Which means that the differences between them are due to different priors of models. Okay, so that's the way to think about how different information criteria change from each other. So that's it. Back it up a little bit. The um, Remember I said that we're going to try and talk about uh, uh, ways to evaluate models for prediction, and I separated that into metrics of model goodness and estimation of those metrics of model goodness. The metric of model goodness here is kind of the subjective Bayesian posterior, and the estimation of that metric of model goodness is the information criteria. And the difference between different methods comes down to that subjective choice of a prior and the way that we choose a prior, they all generally have this property uh, that they put more weight on simple models and they put less weight on complicated models. So a priori, before you've seen any data, due to Occam's razor, you're going to say, I favor the simple model and I have a lower prior on the complicated model. Okay, so those are information criteria from the Bayesian perspective. That's an alternative to cross-validation and an alternative to crystal ball uh, uh, cross-validation crystal ball ways of evaluating models. And it's useful, well, if you're kind of a subjective Bayesian, I don't have to, 
to justify it in any way whatsoever. But for the rest of us, it's useful because it's faster, because cross-validation takes time, and these things are asking very, very similar questions. Okay. Oops, went the wrong way. So, I see in model priors, information criteria and model priors. Information criteria are distinguished, like I said, by what prior they use. The two most common are Akeikes and Bayes information criteria. Um, both of these, and basically everything out there, is proportional to deviance plus some penalty K times the number of parameters in your model. Okay, you guys are probably familiar with these. You know that K is equal to 2 for AIC and K is equal to log N for the BIC. These values here, they come from the following approximation to the model probability. So you might not have seen this before, and some people don't like deriving information criteria this way, but I find it the most sensible way to do it. Remember, we had the model probabilities on the previous page over here, and I said we ignore the probability of data, so the thing we really want to integrate over, or the thing we really want to find is the probability on the right-hand side. What's the probability of data and a model? Well, it's the probability of data and all the parameters in that model integrated over the uncertainty about the parameters in that model. That's what you get over here. So in a regression context, this thing that I was talking about, the model probability, is the integral of this likelihood guy over here, probability of y given betas in my model, little b here. Maybe this is like 25 betas or zero, or not zero integrated over the prior metric on data. Okay. So this is the integral we want. These, model, the, these information criteria come from a Laplace approximation to that integral. Okay. If you don't know what a Laplace approximation is, it's just the second order Taylor series to the function, and then you integrate it. From a statistician's perspective, you assume that the posterior looks basically normal. You, you, know, you take the, the, the normal around the MLE, and you Imagine that instead of whatever approximate shape your posterior could take, your, or sorry, exact shape, shape your posterior could take, you fit a normal curve over it, and then we know the integrals of normal curves because we have lookup tables for multivariate normals, and et cetera. Okay? So that's where all of these come from. They come from this approximation here. Let's get back to our original point. All that changes between these things, because the likelihoods are the same between model information criteria, what changes is the measure that we're integrating over. What changes is the prior, okay? And different priors correspond to different information criteria. AIC2, unless you have really small n, is going to put a lower penalty on complexity than BIC. In other words, the AIC is going to select more complicated models, and its prior works that way. If you're curious, at the end there, there are the actual priors that they correspond to. BIC is this thing called a unit information prior, where the prior is data-based, it's normal with center at beta hat, and um, uh, variance the, the information matrix for that, the expected information for that. Um, AIC's prior, because it was not derived in this way, its prior doesn't make as much sense, but it integrates to this thing over here, which is just a p over 2 times log n, which removes the log n. Here's the AIC and the BIC for the semiconductors. Okay? Uh, remember, we had uh, about 1,500 observations, 100 signals. P was equal to 200 in the full model. Cut was equal to 25 in the cut model. Or sorry, P was equal to 25 in the cut model. Both of the model evaluation uh, information criteria here favor the cut model. So they both agree with what we saw in out-of-sample experimentation, which was that using 25 variables is way better than using 100 or sorry 200 variables. Interestingly, the BIC value for the full model, remember these are on the scale of deviance, so e to the minus of these guys are relative model probabilities, are proportional to relative model probabilities. The BIC of the full model the difference between the BIC of the full model and the BIC of the cut model is much larger than the difference between the AIC and the full model and the AIC of the cut model. Again, that boils down to AIC favoring more complicated models. Okay, so here are information criteria. Information criteria approximate this Bayesian posterior for a model, which is one way of evaluating appropriateness of a model uh, or performance of a model at predicting unseen data. 
Which one do you choose? It's controversial. People argue way too much about it. Um, you'll find out which one you prefer. Generally in different industries or in different areas of academia, one's been preferred over the other. I think in economics, often you see BIC more often. I talk about micro there. In finance, you see AIC all the time uh, because those guys are trying to discover uh, uh, much weaker signals perhaps, I don't know. Um, my take is I like the BIC conservative guy. I work in very high dimensions, so generally a simpler model is going to be better. Um, and uh, it also tends to mirror the out of sample error better, which is something that we'll see in a second. But, you know, again, that's controversial, and you'll find within your field whichever one works better. So, one last thing I'll say about these two information criteria that we're not on there. Why would you ever use information criteria um, as opposed to cross-validation? They're useful in conjunction with the, each other. If they really disagree with each other, then you should question what's going on. You should probably go in there and make sure that there's not something really weird about what you're doing. If they, so if they disagree with each other, there's an issue. The other reason you would want to use an information criteria is if cross-validation just takes too long, okay? Which is going to be pretty often, okay? Especially when you're working through the sort of development phase, when you're building up models. No, you know, not the final model that you run. You can go away for lunch and come back and then put it in Econometrica. But the, all of the models that you've done on process to that, okay, you might not want to take the time to cross-validate everything on route. Okay, if you need answers fast, an information criteria will be what you go with. Okay, so that's ways of evaluating models and how good they are at prediction, and we've seen how that works for the semiconductors and for the uh, and, and, uh, CV for the semiconductors and the information criteria for the semiconductors. Now, both of these methods, and this actually gets to a question that was asked um, at the break, both of these method methods require a set of candidate models. So everything I talked about here was comparing models. And that gets back to bullet point one and my recipe for building, uh, uh, for building models. How do we come up with a manageable set of candidate models? And manageable means we can fit them in the amount of time that we have. There, the way that we do this and the way that I'm going to teach you to do this today is through forward stepwise procedures. Okay? You start from a simple null model, okay? something that has all the parameters set to zero or has all the parameters other than the ones that you definitely want in there. Okay? Regardless of what the data tells you, sometimes you have parameters that you want in there. Okay? It has everything else set to zero. Then what you do is you gradually add complexity to the model. Okay, it's like little paste on a little bit of extra signal, a little bit of extra estimation over here, okay, and build your model up. Let it get more and more complicated, and since we're maximizing likelihood here, let it get closer and closer to the true data, okay, to the data that you observe, okay. In other words, make your fit tighter and tighter and tighter. Your candidate set of models are then all of the models along that path. As you've added complexity from the simple model to the complicated model, every stage along that path, every segment of that path is a candidate model and you can take those candidate models and evaluate them against each other using information criteria and using cross-validation. Okay? That's the basic recipe. Why do we do forward stepwise? Okay? Uh, why is it better than backward selection? Well, in very high dimensions, often backward selection is impossible. If P is greater than N, Okay, and uh, we want to do some sort of least squares type thing. I just can't fit the full model and work backwards from that. Moreover, even if I can fit the full model, often P is big enough that the full model is garbage. Right? So why would you start from something that is you know, kind of acknowledged as terrible? Um, it's also going to be expensive to fit those big models. Right? Fitting the big, full... You know, inverting x prime x could take a lot of time if x is really, really big. So you, whereas the null model is just the null model, it's available in closed form. Okay, so you're going to know exactly what that is. It's, pro it's usually very straightforward to get your hands on. The other reason that you don't want to start from the top is that backwards selection procedures are less stable. Why are they less stable? Because where you start from is unstable. Okay? And what I mean by stability, I use that lingo a lot, I just mean sampling variance. 
right? So if you start an algorithm from a place that has higher sampling variance, in other words, the full model has a lot of sampling variance because you have very few degrees of freedom because P is close to N, that's going to move all over the place. Where you start has a big impact on where you end with the stepwise selection procedure. Okay, so if you have a lot of variability in where you start, where you end has a lot of variability, and the path along there has a lot of variability, as opposed to the null, which is stable, because it just set everything equal to zero. It's the same regardless of what data you get. Okay, these stepwise approaches are greedy. Okay, the engineers call these greedy algorithms. What they do is they're a little bit myopic. They go forward and they say, okay, I have a, a set of constraints the set of constraints is kind of my previous model and whatever extra bit of complexity I'm allowing myself and I solve for that set of constraints. Then I step forward again, I say okay now my, my existing model becomes my previous model and my constraint becomes a little bit more complexity allowed in here and I solve again. It's myopic because it's being greedy and solving at each point for exactly those constraints at each point. It's not thinking about any global properties of the path. Okay, so that's why you have to be careful about where you start these things. Um, many, many, this is you know, kind of an aside, but many, many of the procedures that work well that people use in machine learning, uh, that people use for you know, teaching robots to ride bicycles and things like that, predicting what book you want to buy, many of those algorithms can be seen in a greedy framework. They often work this way. It's a useful way to, to build predictive models. So what is naive stepwise regression? This is probably the stepwise regression that most people here are familiar with. And it works as follows, okay? So in R, there's a function just called step that does this. And it executes this very common routine. You put all univariate models in and you fit them, okay? So I have all models for Y regressed on X, okay? Where X is just one variable. So Y regressed on X1, Y regressed on X2, Y regressed on X3, et cetera, down to Y regressed on XP. I take of those models the one with highest R squared. So the single X that explains the most in linear regression, it's going to be the single X most correlated with Y. And I put that in the model. And then I look, I step forward and I say, okay, my bivariate regression model is going to include that model that I selected at the first stage plus any of the other P minus one variables that I did not select at that first base. So you're going to regress on to X1 plus X2, X1 plus X3, X1 plus X4, all the way through down. And then you're going to choose the bivariate model with the highest R squares. Okay, you're going to put that bivariate model, and then you go to the trivariate model, etc. You keep going. Okay? You could keep going all the way up to uh, uh, the minimum number of P or N. Okay, so you could keep going until you have a completely saturated or the most complicated model available to you. Often, because this takes time, what you do is you evaluate model evalu uh, uh, information criteria, the, in the AIC or the BIC, for all of these models that you're fitting, and you stop when the model that you have has a lower IC value than any of the extra models, the next level of complexity models that you could add in. So if my bivariate model has a BIC and that BIC value is lower than the BIC value for any of the possible three variable models, then I'll stop the algorithm and stick with that BIC. Okay? So that's the way it works. That's naive stepwise regression. I call it naive, probably indicates to you it's not what we're going to use. Um, there's two big problems. One big problem is purely practical and that's cost. Okay? Even with the tiny data set that is the uh, semiconductors, 1,500 observations, right, it's, it's tiddly. Um, it takes three minutes to get out to AIC's stopping value. AIC wants to stop at P equals 68, okay? BIC stops really quickly, but that's because BIC only wants a 10 variable model, so it stops very quickly. Why does it take a lot of time? Well, you're refitting all of these models. To get all the way out to P, you're going to fit P factorial models. That's a lot of models. That's a lot of X prime X inversing to be doing. Um, the other problem with this routine is again stability. Okay? So the, the, I'll mention a little bit later on where the theory on this is coming from, but you're going to have to take me at face value for now. The sampling variance of the model you get through stepwise selection is quite high. If you cross-validated it, Right? If you took a bunch of data sets, you fit a stepwise model on each of them, they would stop at very different places each time. Okay? It's an unstable model selection technique. It's more stable than backward selection, but that's not saying much. 
I'll just mention here actually something that I didn't mention at the beginning. Um, if you go to my website, there's code for today, uh, our code for today that goes through all the examples that I've been doing using the semiconductor data. Okay, so it's a small data set, so it runs really quickly, but I just wanted you guys to have an example. So it's on my teaching page. It says NBER, and then there's code, and then there's data. Okay, so just so you have examples, it's in R, because that's what I use. So now we're going to get into the real core. Of, of what I hope you guys are able to take away from this, which is penalized estimation. Stepwise regression or stepwise routines in general are a great way to build candidate sets. The null model is available in closed form. There's a bunch of theoretically fantastic properties about going from small to big. Greedy algorithms are like the engineer's best friend. They're all over the place. Okay, so there's reasons to go stepwise. There's reasons that we like stepwise. But the naive algorithm is slow and unstable. Those are two things that are not very good. Um, in particular, why does R and every other software routine that works with stepwise regression, why do all of those routines use information criteria for stopping rather than cross-validation? It's because they're slow. They're so slow it makes cross-validation impractical. What you would have to do is cross-validate every of those P minus one models that you would want to add in at each point. You would have to cross-validate at each point. It would take forever. So the alternative um, the way that we do modern stepwise regression is through use of deviance penalties. Okay? And that's the way I like to think about uh, penalized regression. Some people here have probably seen this stuff before. Some people here haven't. To fit penalized regression into the way I'm talking to you about model building today, penalized regression is a way to come up with sets of candidate models. And so here's what penalized regression is. Instead of fitting the MLE, for a regression, instead of fitting the OLS estimate of beta hat, instead of minimizing the deviance, what we're going to do is we're going to minimize the deviance plus a penalty term. Okay, so the minus log likelihood here plus some penalty. And the penalty uh, looks as follows. It's got a land over here, and this lambda is greater than zero. That lambda is called your penalization weight or your penalty weight. And a little c function over here, okay? c of the beta j. This is a little c cost function, c for cost, that you apply to each of your individual regression coefficients. And c has the function, has the property that it's, that it's uh, uh, positive and it's going to have its minimum at zero. We'll explain why that is in a second. For your intuition right here, you could imagine cost function of beta being something like some norm, some L0, L1, L2 norm of beta. So the absolute value of beta raised to either the power of zero, which is just one if beta is greater than zero and zero otherwise. Um, one would just be the absolute value of beta. That's the last one. Two would be beta squared, which is rich. We'll talk more about what these are in a second. Lambda here, the cost function is constant. Lambda is this penalty greater than zero that we have to choose. What does lambda do? It indexes candidate models. And this is why I like presenting penalized estimation uh, in the context of this building candidate models. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> do you want to make the point? No. I'll just, I'll just gesture like this. It's more for my benefit than anybody else's, I think. Um, so lambda, in, uh, lambda is what indexes the models. Okay. And forward stepwise algorithms are going to move from a big lambda to a small lambda. What happens at a big lambda? Well, when the cost that we put on betas is really high, well, then we're going to not want to pay much penalty, which means we're going to have really small betas. If we make lambda big enough, all of our betas are going to be zero. Okay? If, if, if lambda, think about if lambda was infinite. Okay. Well then, for setting a beta anything other than zero, you pay infinite penalty, which means you're going to set all your betas to zero. That's the null model. Okay, so lambda equals infinity indexes the null model. Turns out a bunch of finite lambda values are also going to index the null model. And then what you do is you find that lambda that indexes the null model, okay, the, the, the soup lambda that indexes the null model, and then what you're going to do, or inf lambda, sorry, what you're going to do is you're going to gradually add a little bit of complexity to the model 
by gradually making lambda a bit smaller. Making the penalty that you pay on estimating betas, the penalty that you pay for absolute values of betas, a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller. And you're going to do that along a path, and that's going to give you a candidate set of models. That does not choose the model for you, right? What you then do is you take that candidate set of models and you evaluate them out of cross-validation or using an information criteria. And the combination of those two things, a model evaluation plus a, a, a penalty path, the combination of those two things is what's going to give you the model selection choice at the end. So that's everything there is to know about penalization. Now we're going to go through it more step by step. One. Why are penalty functions minimum at zero? Our cost functions minimum at zero and bigger away from zero? Let's think a little bit about what goes into the decision theory of estimation, because that's really what we're doing here. The moment I start putting costs on things that I'm minimizing, I've stepped into the world of decision theory. Okay? And as you guys, I think that's actually one of the ways that economists can quickly gain access to the theory and the way of thinking about these types of models. You guys tend to be good at decision theory and utility and things like that and thinking about cost, the fact that decisions have cost. Okay, so use that as your access to understanding what's going on here. In estimation and testing, what are the costs of our decisions? Well, estimation, the cost is pretty obvious because we've been minimizing it all along. It's the deviance. Okay, so you know, just based upon inferring from our actions, the fact that we minimize this thing when we estimate, that means probably that's the thing that we want to minimize, that's our cost, okay? Um, testing is a little bit less clear, but it works as follows. All of these testing algorithms, all of these evidence-based algorithms are going to stay at beta equals zero in absence of significant evidence otherwise. That's the whole testing framework. In other words, if I wanted to try and shoehorn that, it doesn't fit very well, but if I wanted to shoehorn that idea into decision theory, what I'm saying is I'm paying a big price for setting beta not equal to zero. So beta equal to zero is safe, and I'm forcing myself to pay a price, a cost, if I want beta be not equal to zero. And the only way I overwhelm that cost is if the deviance, the likelihood side of my joint cost function, okay, uh, has a big enough effect from that beta that it overwhelms the price that I'm paying for moving away from my safe null of beta equals zero. So implicitly, that's the type of decision theory that you guys and I and anybody hypothesis testing has already been working with. What we're going to do now is instead of kind of having that ad hoc definition of or, or try and shoehorn hypothesis testing into decision theory, we're going to talk about penalties right from the beginning and say here are the various penalties. They're going to have the same form that we talked about hypothesis testing have. In other words, they're going to be lowest, you're going to pay the lowest price, price of zero, when beta is equal to zero, because that's safe, that's the null, that's simplicity, that's Occam's razor. And then you're going to pay more price, more cost as you move away from zero. The shapes that these things have, we already talked about this a little bit, they generally can be set up as something close to um, an L alpha norm of beta. The common one is beta squared, that's the ridge. The more common one is the, nowadays, um, is the absolute value of beta, okay? So it's a straight line coming out of zero, okay? That's the lasso. Um, and then there's a bunch of variations that are far less common. The elastic net uh, is a popular cost function that popular. Uh, popular amongst the remaining things that are very unpopular. Uh, uh, but it, it, it's a cost function that moves between the L0 and the L1 norm. Okay? Uh, the, the, or sorry, L2 and L1 norm. So it's something between ridge and the lasso. We'll talk about the properties of these things. And then you have these things called concave penalties. And the log penalty is an example of that. That's where your penalty is no longer um, uh, absolute value of beta to some alpha, it's log of some function of beta. This thing here is equivalent to um, a, a, a L alpha norm where alpha is somewhere be between zero and one. Okay, so you can get these things to match up. I could take a question, I think. Yeah. Just a quick question. So all of these things are going to be sensitive to the units the data is measured in are used to normalize yep. your data first before you do this? Yeah, you can think of it as either normalizing. Thank you. 
Jesse's my director. Um, so it, you can either think about, so the question was, hey, these things are sensitive. It's actually on this slide over here. Um, but I'll leave it for a second. You can think about these things as either being, sorry to camera guy. You can think about these things as either being, uh, um, uh, let me back it up. The question was X scale matters because we're going to penalize the size of beta. You can either think of standardizing your X's in advance or you can think of scaling your lambdas to account for the size of X. Okay? But yeah, you want to standardize your X's in advance. It could have been easier. Okay, here's the big point about variable selection. Um, penalization can yield automatic variable selection. Here's the way it works. You have a big sort of swoopy parabolic type thing, and that's your deviance. The minus of the log likelihood is going to be um, some nice convex function. It's going to be smooth unless you work with crazy models. And what we're doing is we're adding to that nice smooth convex thing something sharp. For example, if you have like the lasso, let's say, that's the penalty that I have in the picture there. And you add that sharp thing to that smooth thing, and what you get out of that at the end of the day is a sharp thing plus a smooth thing. And if the gradient of the sharp thing overwhelms the rate of change in the smooth thing, then you're going to have a sharp point at zero, which is where the sharp thing has its point. So in other words, when you want to find the minimum of the sharp thing plus the smooth thing, it's possible that your minima will lie at exactly zero. And so that's why penalized variable selection, minimizing the deviance plus a penalty, can give you a solution at exactly zero, which is why people say that techniques like the lasso do automatic variable selection. Anything that has an absolute value in it, anything that has a sharp point, Okay, it's going to do this. So the lasso does this, the elastic net does this, the log penalty does this. All of those penalty functions do this. There are many, many penalty options. There, there, there's way too many out there and far too much theory for it. And I am also guilty of adding to that bloated literature. Um, but you can think of the lasso as a baseline. Right? The lasso is, for many reasons, a very reasonable baseline. And that's not to say it's going to be appropriate for every setting, but you can think of the lasso as a baseline. And if you move away from that baseline, you can ask yourself why, what are the properties of it, et cetera. Um, here's the point that was the question. Penalization means that scale matters. Most software that you run will actually do the scaling for you. It will scale the penalty to account for the standard deviation of x so that every beta that you're working with is measured in the scale of unit change, uh, or sorry, change per one standard deviation change in x. Okay, so expect change in the expected value of y per one standard deviation change in the value of x. Cost function properties. There's, as I said, a ton of theory on these things. Um, Victor and Chris tomorrow will talk a little bit about the theory of the different penalty shapes in the context of the problem that they're interested in. Here's just kind of a pointer as to where you can look for things. Ridge is the oldest. It's kind of the great grandfather of these penalty functions. And it's been along far longer uh, than any sort of path estimation or stepwise regression or cross validation or that sort of jazz. Okay, so Ridge goes way back, and it is what we call a James Stein estimator, which is just where you regularize something that you're trying to estimate uh, with uh, squared error loss or squared error penalty. And there's a big literature in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond on kind of optimality of estimators that have this type of shrinkage uh, uh, under different contexts. The original Stein paper is just purely for normal random variables, but there's, it, it's, it's gotten far wider since then. Um, it works well for dense signals. Okay, So of those penalties that we looked at, the only one without a sharp kink in it was the ridge, right? which means the only one that's not going to set things to exactly zero when you're minimizing the penalized deviance is the ridge. And so it's useful for a setting where you don't want to set things to exactly zero, where you think that all of your coefficients matter, sorry, all of your covariates matter, but you think that none of them matter that much. You want them to kind of shrink towards a small value to avoid overfit, not by setting things to zero, 
but by stopping individual coefficients from being overfit. What it does is it moves, it has this nice property, which is one of the things people really like about it theoretically, is that it shrinks the coefficients of correlated variables towards each other. So in my multicollinearity example before, if I put in meters, the size of my house in meters and the size of my house in feet, some jittered version of that, otherwise it would be tough, but you know, meters and feet in there, okay, what Ridge is going to do is it's going to shrink the coefficients on meters and feet towards each other so that each of them will get one half of the effect of the size of my house on whatever it is I'm interested in. Concave penalties, non-convex penalties, all of those penalties that have that sort of spiky shape that flattens out to the edges like the log penalty, these have this function called the oracle property. Okay? The oracle property sounds pretty cool. Um, it, it, has been a big object of interest in the literature and here's what it means uh, usually. There's a few different oracle properties out there but usually when you're talking about coefficient oracle property what it means is that as n gets big and for the more recent literature as n gets big and p gets big the estimates that you get of the, new, the true non-zero betas will converge to the maximum likelihood estimates of those non-zero betas if you knew exactly which betas were non-zero. Okay, so the oracle is in the sense that you know which betas are non-zero. And these penalty, these things apply under, there's a massive literature, so I've, as you can fan from 2000, 2000 basically to 2010, there's a big, or 2008, there's a big literature of him and others uh, coming up with oracle properties in different settings and, and under different constraints, whatever. Basically, it boils down to if you have sparsity, okay, so if the actual coefficients are big and then most of them are zero, okay, and the, the so a large portion of them are zero uh, or very, very close to zero, then you can get these sorts of properties for um, penalty functions that are concave. Okay, so for penalty functions that flatten out in the end. And why is that? Well, let's think about the way that penalty function works. Okay? So that penalty function, if it goes up like the log penalty and it moves way out towards, you know, it flattens out as you get towards big values or big negative values, what that means is that the cost of moving from zero to something a little bit away from zero is big because the penalty you pay at that point is the differential is massive. However, if you have a big signal, Okay, and your big signal is over here, well then the cost of moving from that big signal to a little bit bigger signal is quite small. So what that gives you is a property referred to as unbiasedness for large signals. Okay, so if you have something whose kind of the space that your deviance wants it to be out in that penalty function is out in the flat part of the penalty function, then you're essentially going to go to the MLE because you're not paying any differential in price for moving it more or less for those large values out on the side. So those concave penalties give you unbiasedness for large signals, which is the essential ingredient in getting oracle properties. Lasso is the middle ground between these two. It tends to choose a single input amongst correlated signals. So for example, the size of my house in meters, size of my house in feet, okay? What Lasso will do is it will set the coefficient on one of those to zero and use the other one in your model. Okay, that tends to be what it does. Um, but it also has this non-diminishing bias. So it does not have the property I just described. So the lasso penalty is just increasing at the same rate out to infinity. Okay, so even if I have a really strong signal, it's going to be biased just as much as a signal down close to zero. Okay, so its distance away from the MLE value is going to be the same distance away from the MLE value it would be for a small signal. Okay? So it has those two things. It does not, for that latter reason, the bias of large signals reason, it does not have these types of oracle properties that I just described. That's actually an often misunderstood thing. People think the lasso does have oracle properties. It doesn't. However, it can gain them pretty easily. Okay? So one way that you can make the lasso an oracle is you uh, uh, scale the lambda for each beta depending upon some measure of signal of that beta, right? So the adaptive lasso, who I have in here, Zoo 2006, that stuff, what it does is it uses the least squares 
uh, uh, least squares estimate of beta as a way to scale the size of the penalty. That is in effect a non-concave penalty, uh, sorry, a non-convex penalty, which gives you this unbiasedness for large coefficients. More subtly, if you're not worried about oracle for beta, okay, all of your regression coefficients, if you're just worried about predicting as well as the model where you knew the actual non-zero betas, okay, then all you need to do is cross-validate the, uh, uh, the lambda parameter, which in a sense does kind of make it non-convex because the size of your lambda is becoming a function of the data. Okay? You just cross-validate this that thing and recent results will show you that you have a, uh, an oracle. You will predict as well as the MLE model that knew the actual, um, knew the actual non-zeros as n gets big. So that's a little bit of theory for you guys. Regularization. Okay, so let's get back to this idea of what we're doing here. So back to the practical world. Um, these paths that we're fitting, so where you decrease lambda a little bit and you fit a beta along that path, um, is called a regularization path. And that lingo comes from engineering, where this idea of penalizing things that you want to minimize is, uh, uh, is quite old. Okay, so it's not, not new. Tinkanov regularization is uh, ridge regression just with a different name in the operations literature from far earlier. Um, and the idea behind regularization is a common one in process and, and, and structural engineering, which is you depart from an optimal system, or so you depart from optimality in exchange for some stability. Okay? So think about building a bridge. Uh, you could build the optimal bridge to minimize some cost function over the amount of, I don't know, cost of materials, the constraints that you've dreamed up for how much uh, pressure that bridge is going to be coming under from wind, from the cars that go over it, the maximum load, number of cars, etc. And you could build the exactly optimal bridge for that. Okay? I would not want to drive on an optimal bridge because there's probably something that the engineers didn't fit into their stylized model when they were optimizing okay, that I would like to you know, worry about and, and have, uh, uh, have cautioned for. So generally what they do is instead of building the lightest, fastest, whatever possible bridge that you can have out there, what they do is they move away from the sort of constraints that you would have on that in some sort of safer direction. Now for us in the regular, in the estimation world, safe is always towards beta equals zero, which is why we regularize towards beta equals zero. Um, so fitting beta for decreasing lambda is called a regularization path. The lasso in particular is a candidate for the new least squares. So this is what people do now as a first stage. OLS is no longer really the first thing that people think to do. And it's actually, for big P, it is as fast to fit a lasso once, the entire regularization path from null model up to OLS, like fully specified, unpenalized model, lambda equals zero. It is as fast to fit that once as it is to do a single OLS. In other words, to invert x prime x to the minus one. I think the P where that starts to kick in is you know, a few hundred. Okay? Even for the um, semiconductors here, it says four, I think it's actually around three. It takes about three seconds to fit the entire lasso path for the semiconductors. It takes about one and a half seconds to invert x prime x. Okay? So even for that small P, you're basically on the same scale. Now why is that? It's the genius of these things. Okay, so what you're doing is you're, you're moving along a path. We've come up with a set of candidate models. And remember, one of the constraints I said when I was fitting candidate models, one of the things I need is the ability to fit all of these models quickly because I want to cross-validate them and stuff. So what happens here is when you move along the path, if you look at that picture there, that's a regularization path for the semiconductors. As I change lambda, the x-axis there is lambda. As I change lambda a little bit, what happens to my beta coefficients, okay? So the y-axis on this picture is the beta coefficients that you have, okay? And the x-axis is the lambda, co the lambda penalty. And so the path is in how those beta hats move as I change the amount of penalty I pay. And as the penalty I pay moves a little bit, the coefficients only change a little bit, which means that updating my model estimates for a new lambda that's a little bit smaller than my previous lambda is near instant. We basically just project out in a line 
from where we were previously and then correct a little bit and we're going to do a pretty good job. Okay, so it's very, very fast to move through that way, almost as fast as just inverting the x prime x in the first place. That is the genius of penalized estimation. Okay? It is not a way to select models, as we already said, it's just a way to come up with candidate models. It's a way to very quickly come up with a good, large, detailed set of candidate models. Sounds too good to be true? Yes, because you need to choose lambda. However, we know how to choose lambda, so it is too good to be true. We have these methods out there, like cross-validation and information criteria, that we can use to evaluate a bunch of different models. Okay? So lambda here is like our signal-to-noise ratio, right? And, uh, or a signal-to-noise filter. And I like to think about it like a, a squelch on a radio, like on a VHF radio. So if you, if you talk on a VHF radio, those of you that don't use VHF radio, uh, <laughs> it's like the noise cancellation on your cell phone, right? Um, so so if, if you turn the squelch on a radio up all the way, you hear nothing. You get no signal. As you turn the squelch down, you start to hear uh, transmissions until you turn it all the way off and you just get, you just get static. Okay? And the trick to actually communicating with people on a radio is finding the point in the middle there where you just hear the person's voice and you don't hear any other static. That's what Lambda does here. Okay? So what we do is through our model evaluation tools that we have, information criteria and out of sample uh, cross validation, what we do is we move the squelch, we move Lambda, and we see how well that squelch, that lambda value does in predicting the unseen data, in predicting the left out data. So the way it works here, and this is actually a key point to understand, is you fit regularization paths for each training sample. So let's go back a step. Uh, cross validation is I have, um, a, I, a, let's say tenfold cross validation. I fit the model to 90%. And I predict on left out 10%. Then I fit the model to 90% and I predict on left out 10% over and over again, 10 times. What you do when you cross validate a lasso or any regularized regression or penalized estimation routine is you fit the entire path for the 90%. And then you use the beta calculations from that path fit to the 90% on the left out 10%. Okay, so you're not cheating here, you're not kind of fitting the betas using all of the data, no. You're using lambda to index a, a candidate set of models on a training set. And so then what you do at the end of the day is you choose the best lambda, I'll tell you what that means in a second, you choose the best lambda and then you fit a path to the entire data set and use the estimates for lambda that was best in your cross validation for the lasso or for the penalized estimator fit to the entire data set. So that's mechanically what goes on here. There's two ways that you can decide what is the best lambda. One is just what has the minimum out of sample error. Okay, so what is the minimum out of sample deviance? It's a, called the naive or, or CV min is something that people call it. An evidence way of doing this that stabilizes the procedure that leads to lowering sampling variance and the complexity of the model that you're going to get. It's conservative in some sense, is that it moves you towards simpler models. The rule of thumb, called the 1SE rule of thumb here, is to take the model that has the, the largest lambda, whose out of sample average error is no more than one standard error away from the minimum out of sample standard error. Okay, so there's two lines on this picture up here. This line over here the one that shows put nothing in the model. That's the one SE error. It's hard to see here because we don't have error bound. And this is the minimum cross-validation error. This is for the semiconductor data. Okay. So what I have here is on the y-axis, I have binomial deviance. On the x-axis, it's the exact same thing that I had on the previous slide of those coefficient paths. Pass. I have the log penalty. And you can see around these dots, there's some error bars out on the left-hand side. Okay? Those are one standard error for the out-of-sample mean of the cross-validation error. Right? So it's just the, the 10 uh, x bar out-of-sample error um, divided by the square root of 10, right? because that's our standard error for the mean out-of-sample error. And so that's our one plus or minus one standard error. Because of the scale on the plot, you don't see those out on the right-hand side, but they're there. The line on the right-hand side is the largest lambda 
whose blue dot is no more than one standard error away from the minimum blue dot, which is on the leftmost dashed line. Okay? So that's called the one standard error rule. Any serious software out there will do this for you and do the cross-validation. Okay? Um, these, for example, were fit in R uh, using, actually these ones were fit using the Gambler package for R. These ones were fit using the GLM net package for R. They do essentially the same thing um, at, at a lasso. Um, and it's as simple as I have the code down there. If you have X and you have Y, I told it family equal binomial because this is for my semiconductor, so I'm doing logistic regression. It's as easy as that. What that does is it's cv.glmnet. It's going to fit for uh, the, I think it does tenfold cross validation or fivefold cro cross validation by default. It does that. It fits the pass for all of the left out, and it's going to return to you a picture of how well it did on all of the left out stuff, as well as the coefficients for the full model. Okay, fit to all of the data, and which lambda did best out of sample by the minimum rule or by the 1SC rule. So it basically does everything for you in one click of the button. And I don't know, I think for this data set here, it takes, um, it takes like 20 seconds or something like that, okay, 15 seconds. So very fast, very easy. There's really no excuse for not including this type of stuff as one of the things that you do if you're doing pattern detection in high dimensions. It's, very mainstream now. Here is kind of a key idea about um, the lasso in particular. So not penalized estimation in general, um, but about the lasso in particular. Actually, let me just pause right there because it's been a little bit. Are there any questions? If anybody wants, yeah, question. Yep. Um, with the lasso, yes, for the reason I'm going to talk. Sorry? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so the question was can I translate? Well, the question was actually if I have a nice cross validation plot like what I have there where it goes smoothly down to a point where it does best out of sample and then it increases up uh, uh, and does poorly. Do I need to worry less about stability of cross-validation as a model selection routine? And the answer is yes, you can worry less about stability. And that's actually not something just as a function of this plot, that's a function of the lasso. Okay, and think about, we'll talk about this more in a second, but the lasso is far more stable than subset selection and forward stepwise selection because when you move from one penalty to the next, the beta coefficients are only allowed to move a little bit. So if you jitter the data, kind of the dual of that problem is if you jitter, jitter the data, well, the cost function and everything means you're not going to move very far on that path there. Okay, so that introduces stability into the candidate set of models, and when you cross-validate a stable set of candidate set of models, cross-validation itself reaps the benefits and becomes a more stable method. So we'll see theoretically a little bit more what that means in a second, but your intuition is 100% correct. Other question? Yeah? Um, is there a reason for the one S, is the one SE rule really germane? I mean, do we believe that if we have a model that has more parameters that like, it'll form yeah. worse? So, so there's, there's plenty of really good theory about how well cross-validation approximates actual out-of-sample prediction error. Um, and it, the, it's a tough, tough thing because you're inevitably talking about how well does this in-sample experiment do at predicting data I have not seen. And so you're going to have to have some modeling constraints and whatever in order to come up with some theory there. There's good work. So... Um, you know, Brad Efron has stuff in the early 2000s and late 90s, um, and those guys advocate this 1SE rule as actually being a better, uh, uh, giving you better true out of sample uh, prediction errors. So to go meta on you again, if you cross validated, cross validation, the 1SE rule tends to do better than the cv.min rule. Okay, so you can keep kind of building that Russian doll of cross-validation up conceptually. Um, so yeah, so it is for prediction reasons. Um, 
you know, here it's a little bit interesting because the 1SE rule here chooses no uh, semiconductors, uh, or sorry, no diagnostics. It actually says to the people at the semiconductor manufacturing firm, you should just be tossing out every 15th chip. That's what the 1SE rule says. Um, you know, when we cherry picked the best 25 signals, okay, we only got a 10% out of sample, right, when we cherry picked on the full sample, so I'm not actually sure that that's a bad result. Um, there is some non-linearity here that we're not accounting for, but yeah, so anyway, so it might be that you want to conclude something, right, just for, you need something, so then you'll go with the min, but in general, the 1SE rule is what you want to go with. I find my MBAs often go for the min because they want more story to tell, but <laughs> you guys won't do that. Okay, so, um, so information criteria and the lasso. This is, you know, so all of these techniques are penalized estimation. We'll talk a little bit more about what's good, what's bad, in particular the, the non-convex penalties. The lasso has a bunch of advantages. One of them is that stability, right? So the fact that the betas change very little as you move along the regularization path is, is, is a big deal. Moreover, the lasso has this super, um, I would think, surprising and fantastic result about its degrees of freedom, and that works as follows. So we could ask ourselves if we wanted to use a, an information criteria, the BIC or the AIC, things like that. What would the number of parameters be? Well, we called them number of parameters, but you guys all know number of parameters is really degrees of freedom here. Okay? So it's what, kind of, what is the effective number of parameters? Um, in other words, could I translate to a different space either via penalization or whatever, and this is the number of dimensions in that translated space that I've actually had free when I wanted to estimate my predictor. Um, we could ask ourselves, what are the degrees of freedom in a penalized estimation routine? Well, it's not clear. Think about L0 cost. So L0 is just subset selection. You pay a price for every extra beta that you add to the model. It's a fixed cost. Okay, this is like what the naive stepwise algorithm was trying to optimize. Okay. Well, we have p hat parameters in a model, and that's actually what the naive stepwise regression uses, right? If I stop at 60 parameters, like AIC did, or 68 parameters, well, then when it calculated, when our step function calculated the information criteria, it used uh, uh, 68 as the degrees of freedom. But that's clearly not true, right? There's a big difference between cherry picking as I go along the 68 parameters that are most useful for predicting the data I have and being given a set 68 parameters. So the degrees of freedom that we've used up are yes, the number of parameters in our model plus a certain number of degrees of freedom that we've used in searching in order to find those optimal parameters uh, to put into our regression equation. A fantastic and surprising result about the lasso is as follows. Intuitively, what happens, actually I'll tell you the result first of all, it's just that the number of, degree, the number of variables that you fit, the number of non-zero uh, beta, is an unbiased estimate of the degrees of freedom. Okay? So you can use, to put this in purely practical terms, degrees of freedom here is the kind of the Stein degrees of freedom. If you're into that type of thing, sure, Stein's unbiased risk assessment. Um, it's the covariance between your predicted values and y. Okay, but you guys can just think about it degrees of freedom the same way that you always have. The number of non-zero betas can be used as the degrees of freedom for a given lasso fit. Okay? That's pretty fantastic and pretty surprising, I think, when you compare it to the intuition of subset selection where I told you, hey, degrees of freedom has got to be some number greater than the number of parameters in our model. But it's the bias kicking it, right? So what's happening is, yes, because you're choosing from a bunch of variables, you're paying the price and extra degrees of freedom there. However, for each variable in our model, we're biasing it down towards zero. So we're not letting that variable fully enter the model. Okay, we're, we're attenuating the signal that we get from each, individual, uh, from each individual variable that's in the model. Okay, so imagine if you just had a fixed number of parameters 
and you fit, you didn't do any model selection, but you just kind of fit uh, a penalized deviance for that fixed number of parameters, well then you would be using less than p degrees of freedom because you're obviously not going to get as tight a fit as the MLE. It turns out that the number of degrees of freedom you give away by penalizing, by biasing your coefficients, moves with the number of degrees of freedom that you're adding by searching amongst covariates. Okay, really fantastic stuff. Um, if you're curious, the paper is the Zoo Hasty Tibshrani 2007 one. It builds heavily on stuff by Efron and, and Ye actually in, in, in 2000 or in 1998. What this means is that we can use information criteria for the lasso. Okay? So we have a degree of freedom parameter, which is what you need for the AIC and the BIC to work. Okay, it's what you need for those approximations, those Laplace approximations to the integral to make any sense at all. And so what we do is we just take the deviance plus uh, the number of parameters, which is an unbiased, finite sample, unbiased estimate for the degrees of freedom, uh, and plug that into our information criteria. Okay, so the BIC is going to be deviance plus number of non-zero parameters times the log of n. Um, as I said, the reason you use information criteria is really because cross-validation takes too long. I don't think very many practitioners would say, I love the theory of information criteria and Bayesian posterior model probabilities, so that's why I use it. I'll just ignore whatever out-of-sample stuff says. Nobody says that, but the reason they use it is that it's way faster. Okay, So it works in cases where cross-validation does not work. And we can feel confident using the lasso in those information criteria because of this degrees of freedom result. Um, I was talking with Chris about this at the break. It's eerie how well the BIC agrees with the 1SE rule. Okay, so the difference between the BIC and the 1SE rule, BIC min and the 1SE rule, is usually less than the difference between the 1SE rule, far less than the difference between the 1SE rule and the min. Okay, so it's usually within one standard error put it another way. Here it is for the COM score data. So this data was at the very beginning. I used it to motivate. Now it's going to pop back up. We're going to work with it for a little bit because it's a bit of a more high dimensional, more realistic example. So just to recall, uh, web browsing, we had, uh, we had Y was some measure of what people spent online. It's actually divided up into a bunch of different categories. You can do some cool multinomial regression stuff here. But for us, we're just going to look at among the people that bought something, okay, the 60,000 consumers, we're going to look at their total log consumption, the total amount that they spent online. And we're going to model that as a logistic, or sorry, as a, a, the log of that total consumption. Okay? Um, that's just a linear regression model that's a function of x, where x is the Sorry, X is the percent of your time spent on each of 8,000 websites. So these were the 8,000 websites that people spent more than, or that more than 5% of the machines in our sample actually visited. Okay, so it's just linear regression, log, amount of money you spend online, regressed on to uh, percent of time that you've spent on 8,000 websites. So X here is going to be a big vector of percents of times on websites. Most of it's going to be zero for every machine because most machines, most people visit fewer websites than they do visit. Okay, and then it's going to have these little uh, 1%, 2%, 4%, etc. in there. So the lasso path, just to bring it all together, right? Let's bring this into a least square setting. The lasso path is minimizing the deviance plus the L1 penalty times lambda. Okay. The deviance for a linear regression model is we're going to, uh, we actually remove, so when you do linear regression, you just pull sigma squared out from everything here. So we're minimizing this deviance here. Um, it's the sum of squares, or one half the sum of squares to make it a log likelihood, plus lambda times the sum of the absolute values of the beta. So we're just doing least squares like you guys always did, except what we're doing is we have over on the side a penalty on beta. And here's what you get out of sample. So the picture on the left, I did this with cv.glmnet. It takes about five minutes to run per lasso, right? So 60,000, 8,000, it's still pretty quick. Um, the picture on the left is your out of sample deviance. It's the same as mean squared error here. And you see the lambda 1SE rule 
is pretty close. It's just below, or sorry, just above minus four. So it's the log lambda chosen there is about minus three something, high threes. And the min is, is just above. To the right, I've calculated the BIC for each of the models along this path. And you see it looks pretty similar, right? This is why practitioners like the BIC, okay? Um, and in particular, if you look, it's actually just shifted a little bit to the right, the BIC curve relative to the cross-validation curve. And if you look at the min of that BIC curve and that one SE line, the, the rightmost line on the leftmost plot, you see that they match up pretty closely, and they do. Okay. Here, just to bring us finally back to some actual data and some coefficients, I thought this would be a nice vacation from abstract ideas. BIC chooses a model with about 400 non-zero beta hats. Um, here are some of the big absolute values of those beta hats. These are on, uh, remember this is on the scale of 1% extra time spent on one of these websites translated into log of total consumption. The coefficients are massive because spending 1% of your time on shoppingsnap.com means you're spending a lot of your time on shoppingsnap.com, right? <laughs> These are not normalized by standard deviation, the amount of time spent on everything, okay? Um, but you kind of see, you get what you might expect. If you spend a lot of time on bellagio.com, we anticipate you spend more money online, okay? or you have spent more money online. This is, you know, people could have been spending money on these websites. This is very much like reduced form type stuff here, okay? No structure to this. The gambling thing's interesting because it turns out we think you're a big spender if you're on Bellagio, but if you're on Scratch to Cash, um, which is also kind of a gambling type website, but maybe a lower brow one, um, then we think you spend less money online, okay? So there it is, just to give you some coefficients of what you get out of these things. But, you know, this is the type of stuff you'd expect. I don't think there's maybe a causal relationship between scratch for cash and less money online. In fact, it's probably the other way because you're probably spending money when you're on scratch to cash, right? But it's correlated for some reason, okay, and that's what pops up here. It was probably correlated with 5,000 other websites, and scratchtocash.com is the one that the lasso selected. Okay, so this is useful for you going in there and figuring out penalties. Um, it's not necessarily going to pick up those causal relationships, and Chris and Victor will tell you tomorrow how to do that type of thing. If you scale by standard deviation, you see the big, um, the, the places you might expect pop up, you know, united.com, orbits, whatever. Okay, if you're on those websites, I was just on united.com, you're probably booking a flight if you're on that website. It's not that much fun. Okay, um, so there's some data, okay? So now what we can do is, first of all, any questions about that right there? Okay, so now let's go a little bit deeper into the idea of how you choose your penalty shape, okay? And in particular, I'm going to talk about something that I think appeals and applies to a lot of economists because you guys are very used to fitting things with MLE and sucking all possible signal out of an X, right? So getting the beta that's optimal in some sense, right? We're not necessarily people here haven't been building airplanes, so um, which is not a bad thing, right? Uh, so, so the concave penalties that I mentioned, the ones that have the shape like this, I think are appealing and I've found appealing to economists because they let you, if the variable's in the model, it really gets to be in the model. You estimate it at its MLE. And that's appealing because we like MLEs. We want to, you know, given we're going to have it in our model, we want to really nail it and give it the best coefficient value possible. Okay? Um, it's tempting. We got to be careful with those. Okay? And the reason was actually brought up earlier with your question, which is, you know, bias. Right? We, we, yes, we want to get away from bias. We like unbiased estimators, maybe. However, when you get away from bias, you introduce instability. You increase your sampling variability. That's true 
in any sort of model estimation technique, even for fixed betas. But what we've built here is kind of this edifice of model building. We, you know, we fit paths from the beginning to the end, and then we do another estimation thing. So we first estimate candidate models, then we estimate how well those candidate models predict out of sample, and then we estimate the estimate, the best estimate of the one that did well predicting out of sample, either 1SE or min. There's a lot of steps going into this. There's a lot of places for sampling variants to really explode and when you move to unbiased estimators you can have that sampling variance explode okay? so the classic there's tons of literature on this and I think it's something that people that work in high dimension could really read up on and internalize and the literature is fantastic there's stuff in the kind of standard frequent statistics sampling variance literature there's a ton of stuff in the Bayesian literature about why bias is good, right? You know, it's good because I am biased. Um, and, uh, and then there's, I think a great paper is this Bryman 1996 paper. It was really kind of the uh, pushing out of cross-validation techniques. Um, and he's a little bit agnostic about what it means and he just goes into, hey, you know, what's going to work well with cross-validation? Okay, so if I have a model that is this stable, is it gonna is cross validation gonna be a good way of selecting that model? Okay, if I make that model less stable, where does cross validation fail as a way of selecting models? So just kind of as a lit pointer, I think that's a nice reference. Um, history as well, that's that's where the idea of random forests come from. For those of you that work with those things, they were seen as a way of stabilizing trees so that you could actually do cross validation on them. So for us, in our world, bias is what makes the regularization paths continuous. So bias is what gives those coefficient plots, which are useful for understanding what's going on here, right? Log penalty on the x-axis, beta on the y-axis. Bias is what makes those coefficient plots continuous, okay? So not only does moving away from bias have big implications for sampling variance, for stability, it also has big computational cost implications, right? Because I motivated lasso being super fast because as you move along that path, your coefficient changes very little. If your coefficient changes very little, the algorithm is quite quick. Without bias, your coefficient is going to jump all over the place. The algorithm gets much slower. We're going to see exactly what that means in terms of numbers in a second. Here's one way to think about what's going on here. There is breathing room between subset selection and kind of complete exploding instability and the lasso, which is a constant bias as you go out towards infinity. It turns out that those jumps in your solution path, those jumps as you move lambda down a little bit, they happen if your cost function has the following property. Okay, there it is in terms of numbers and derivatives. But basically what it is, is if your cost function, the curvature of your non-convex -con cost function at zero, if that curvature, the acceleration down of that curve, is faster than the negative curvature of your deviance at that point, okay, well then you're gonna have a jump in your cost function. The pictures here are what it looks like. So there's, it's a little bit hard to see the dashed line, I think maybe, but I have two penalty functions. One of them has steeper curvature. One of them is more concave than the other one. And I add a little bit of signal here. So V is the thing I'm trying to predict. This is just, you know, I'm minimizing a least squares thing for one random variable, X on V. Okay, so as X times V gets higher, the correlation between X and V is higher, or I've added data to the model, whatever. It's just my signal, the deviant side starts to weigh more. And as I add in that signal, you can see what happens to the sum of the two things. Instead of being like lasso where it was a nice steep thing with one minimum, if it's too curved, if it's like the solid line, then you get a bimodality. In other words, you're estimating a thing that has two, uh, 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 two minima. And what happens is as you gradually increase the penalty weight, or decrease the penalty weight, that bimodality is going to be creeping down. You'll be at zero, 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 and then all of a sudden that bimodality over here, the second mode, okay, is lower than the spike at zero. You're not going to smoothly move away from zero. Your solution for beta jumps out to the bottom of that second mode, okay? So this is, I think, a useful way geometrically 
to understand the idea of instability. Because it's one thing for me to stand up here and say, hey, you know, you get too much, uh, uh, too concave a penalty, or, you know, you go to stubs, subset selection and everything gets unstable. It's another thing to see it and what actually happens and imagine jumping from the spiky bit out to the rounded bit. Okay? Now, the nice thing about the log penalty, okay, so this over here, I should mention that, sorry. This over here is the log penalty, right? So this is that um, log of s plus, or the penalty is some positive s or lambda times log of r plus the absolute value of beta, okay? So that was the curvy penalty on my picture a few slides back. And the log penalty is nice because for certain parameters, you can have uh, uh, something that basically gets as close to infinite curvature Right, so where you have subset selection, right? So where you pay no price, and then the moment you move infinitesimally away from zero, you play a big price, so subset selection. And it can go all the way out to the lasso, okay? So it can go kind of between the L0 and the L1 norms, and that's some of the things that I work on. Um, this curvature here, and this is, I think, another useful way to understand these things. The curvature of this model for the log penalty is S over R squared. Okay, so the log penalty is S times log of R plus absolute value of beta. Okay? And the curvature here, I call it the variance of lambda. And that might seem strange until I tell you that all of these penalized maximum likelihood estimation methods, all of these regularization paths can be interpreted as a Bayesian model where the cost function comes out of a prior that you've placed on the betas. Okay? The classics are ridge regression corresponds to a Gaussian prior on beta. Lasso is a Laplace prior. If you haven't heard of the Laplace distribution, you can look that up on Wikipedia. Um, other ones have funnier names. Okay? Uh, it turns out that the log penalty, okay, that nice concave penalty that goes from L0 to L1, depending upon the parameters you use, corresponds to a hyper prior on lambda, on the L1 cost, that's unique to every beta, uh, that's conjugate to the Laplace distribution, to the distribution that corresponds to the lasso, and it's a gamma, okay? So if what I said makes no sense at all, but you think you have a good grasp on Bayes, what I'm doing when you, when you go with the log penalty is the same as being a good Bayesian and sitting down and saying, I don't know what lambda is for every coefficient, so instead I'm gonna put a gamma distribution prior on the lambda, independent, independent lambdas for each coefficient, and that gamma is gonna have shape S and rate R, and that pops you out the uh, uh, log penalty if you solve jointly for both beta and lambda. Okay? So that's neither here nor there, there's, there's this, um, this literature on coming up with Bayesian interpretations of these things. It's useful if you have that in your background. It's useful, I notice people nodding, so maybe it's useful, maybe people do understand, kind of have a bit of a Bayesian background, uh, find um, variances a useful way to think about the world, or variances of penalties. I like it because I can call S over R squared the curvature um, you know, the second derivative of my cost function, it's just the variance of lambda, which if I talk to someone, I can say, hey, here's my variance of lambda. You might have a sense that you understand what that is. Maybe you don't. Um, so there's literature out there on that. In many ways, this is a nice, useful way to think about uh, penalization, okay? Um, you can think about it as a relaxation of a lasso, okay? And the joint problem, so this is my little hobby horse, one of them, the joint problem of optimizing, the, the, sorry, the problem of optimizing a, you know, deviance plus a non-convex cost function has that property that it's multimodal, which means that as an optimization guy, stuff doesn't work, right? It's just really hard to go to the bottom of something when that something has multiple bottoms, okay? Turns out that the joint problem of when you set it up as a Bayesian model, finding the optimal beta and the optimal lambda, which is the same as finding the bottom of that bimodal thing, is unimodal, has a single bottom. And these are a couple pictures that explain that. 
Okay? But the point of this is neither, you know, not so much to push and say, hey, you need to understand the optimization details of these things. It's just to say we can move away from L1, away from the lasso, towards subset selection, which is what everybody here probably thought they wanted to do before I talked to you today. You can move along that spectrum and more and more concave penalties, less and less stability, and you can see what happens. And when you're moving along that spectrum, you can parameterize in terms of the variance of lambda, and that has this Bayesian interpretation. So here is a, is a plot that Jesse requested. So, um, so here, here's a plot of just the practical issue of instability. So remember, let's wrap the, let, let's just refresh a little bit. What I've told you is that lasso is good because it's stable, because your solution paths are stable. I then said, well, that's not just lasso. Any penalty whose curvature has absolute value less than the absolute value of the curvature of the deviance is going to have that property that it's going to be stable. Okay. Um, now let's talk about what stability means. Stability means lower sampling variance, all these good things. You should read the Bryman paper and the others out there. That's a big deal. It also means big things in terms of compute time. And here's what happens for fitting that ComScore data, a lasso path through the entire data set, as I change the curvature. And I've parameterized here in terms of the variance of lambda. And what you see is as I increase, basically everything's below a minute, right? So. Um, the dot and the line at the very far left look like they're different. That's just plot and R. Um, basically, the values were all around 45 seconds or so for a single, uh, a single path through the data at the lasso. And for those non-convex penalties, for small values of the variance of lambda. As the variance of lambda gets big, all of a sudden the compute time shoots up. Okay? And that's because of that instability. All of a sudden, we've reached a point where the paths are no longer smooth, where we have that bimodality thing going on, and all of a sudden, things shoot up. Now, these are still reasonable compute times, four or five minutes, whatever. Subset selection here, which is like not our subset selection, but a greedy algorithm where I just choose the covariate with the uh, largest gradient with respect to the current model at each time. Okay, So it's kind of like a very fast subset selection. That takes about a half hour. The full OLS path here, a single, just to calibrate these times, the single full OLS path takes about three hours or greater than three hours on a pretty fast machine. Okay? Now these paths all go out to about 5,000 degrees of freedom and then I stop them. The full OLS goes out to 8,000 degrees of freedom. Okay? But you know, whether that's worth your time depends upon how much your time is worth. So that's a picture of exploding time costs. Just to internalize what's going on here, right? Here's so the the variance values are on a weird scale because it's multiplied by n, the curvature. Okay, but a variance of of 1,000 here, everything is still smooth. Okay, because the curvature of my penalty has not overwhelmed the curvature of my deviance. Everything's still smooth. That was one of the things that took less than a minute. We move things up two orders of magnitude. All of a sudden, the penalty is no longer. Uh, that's, where, that's where computation cost exploded, and you can see why it is right here. It's because these are just for a few. This is not all of the covariates, but just for a few. When you add something to the model, it jumps into the model, and everything else has to be adjusted. At the far right-hand side is if I plot subset selection, and it's, again, all over the place. right? So every time I change my penalization a little bit, every time I change the thing that indexes my candidate set of models, the model fit that I get jumps all over the place. And to go back to the original question about stability, the dual to this is if I jitter the data a little bit, the plot on the left is not going to change much. The plot on the right is going to change dramatically. Okay, so algorithm cost and um, computational complexity. So that is the uh, second section. So. Back after uh, after lunch, um, we, the the last section was a doozy, right? As as I, Jesse was just saying, we warmed up a little slowly, starting with hypothesis testing and things people understood and had seen before, and then we really kind of went through the wall with some new techniques and talking about how they work and when they work and stability, etc. So um, I think that the basic recipe 
is a really useful paradigm through which to evaluate a lot of what goes on in, in, in data mining and in, and in good high dimensional statistics, which is you come up with a way to get a set of candidate models. And the way that I said that's a really good way to come up with sets of candidate models is a lasso or other some, some other sort of regularized path, path algorithm. And then once you have that set of candidate models, you're going to find some metric for evaluating and choosing amongst those models. And you have to understand that those metrics or measures that you are using are approximations or estimations of something else, either be that crystal ball out of sample variance or Bayesian model probabilities or some combination of the two. But that kind of mix of, hey, candidate set, estimation of some sort of predictive thing, and then actually apply that one onto the other is, I think, a really nice way of thinking about model building. Today, we're going to, or for the last section here, the last hour, <clears throat> we're going to talk about something that people in the room are probably more or less familiar with, uh, which is factor modeling. And this is a big ingredient into high dimensional variable analysis or high dimensional statistics. And it fits in quite nicely with the things that we've already described. Okay, so so this is not orthogonal to uh, the material that I've already gone through. It's it's a natural complement. Okay, so the types of model selection. When I said model selection, it was really just variable selection. We were setting betas to zero. Uh, the types of things that we did in the first stretch was all that, and that's just one way to reduce dimension. It's kind of the simplest way to reduce dimensions, just set some things to zero and say they don't matter. There's, there's a vast number of other ways you can reduce dimension, and many of them are best understood within this framework of a factor model. So I've written a factor model up there. I have the expected value of x. x here is my big high dimensional vector of stuff, covariates. Right? Maybe these are my 8,000 websites that I'm looking at traffic on, uh, your cookies for. Or maybe these are my uh, 200 signals for my semiconductors or whatever. And what I'm going to say is that the expected value of x, okay, what I would let, think I should see for an individual x, is actually a, just a linear function of, of some underlying factors that I call v. Okay? And V here is, let's say, X is 8,000 dimensional. Say it's my website thing. And let's say I think that, yeah, there's a there's bunch of different counts that you would have for, or percentages of time that you would have spent at, at all of these various websites. But I think there's really only 25 different types of browsers out there, different types of people as far as I'm concerned. And, and the variation beyond those 25 is not of interest to me. And so what I say is, hey, the expected counts or the expected frequency of time spent at each of these websites is some upscaling of what I would expect for each of those 25 different browser types. And you could be a mix of one type of browser and another type of browser. Maybe it's a shared machine. My wife's one type of browser. I'm another type of browser. And so the info that Comscore sees is going to be some comparison of the, some combination of the two of us. OK, so I think people here are generally familiar with the idea of what a factor model is. That's one of the things that economists have actually been very good at is, is among many things, uh, very good at is coming up with uh, factor models and useful factor models and stories behind factor models. So the, the equation is just this, linear algebra. x is p-dimensional. v is k-dimensional, where k is much smaller than p. That's so what makes the, the whole thing useful. And phi here is, let's see if I'm going, uh, phi here is going to be a K by P matrix. Okay? Does that make sense? I might have got my tilde wrong. But anyways, phi is K by P in some dimension. Okay? Um, we were actually already working with factor models. In the semiconductor example, uh, the, the, um, the, the X's that we were working with were actually factor scores. They were V's from a fit to a much larger set of X's. Okay? So those were principal components uh, for a larger set of signals. That's why they were independent. Not independent in the statistical sense, but independent in the linear algebra sense. They were orthogonal to each other. 
when you do factor modeling of this sort, and if you want to use it for prediction of stuff, which as we've discussed is really the name of the game, what you do is you just regress, once you have your factors, your Vs, instead of regressing onto your big high dimensional X, instead you regress onto V. And that's way easier to do because V is of smaller dimension than X. And so this is kind of something you can just do with your usual least squares type routine or whatever you want. Um, in this enterprise, it is much better to have Y and X both inform estimation of V. Okay? So where you just come up with a factor model for X, like principal components, which we'll discuss more in a second, that's called unsupervised modeling. Okay? It's unsupervised because you're just finding the factors that explain the dominant sources of variation in X. Whereas supervised is if you want to explain the dominant sources of variation of X that are relevant for Y. And this might seem like a very subtle little distinction, but it matters in data mining context. Typically with really big data, kind of beyond what we've talked about today, but the stuff where you need, you know, clusters of machines to store things in the cloud. We presume the reason you're storing so much data is not because you want to get a really, really low precision uh, or high precision estimate of X bar or something like that. The reason you're storing that much data is you're going to try and pick up some sort of rare signal or outliers or something like that. Okay? Which means that probably the thing that explains the dominant sources of variation in X is not the thing you're looking for because almost by definition of the problem you're looking for a rare signal that's not going to be the dominant source of variation. Okay, so just to have in the back of your mind as stuff beyond today, supervised factor models, I don't think we'll talk about it at all, but supervised factor models is where you both estimate the factors as explaining X and Y jointly. Okay? That's kind of a step beyond first what we're going to talk about today, which is still very valuable because it underlies these other methods, or where you come up with an unsupervised factorization for X and you're going to use that in regression for Y. And it does still work very well, especially on the scale problems that I think most economists are facing. The most common way of doing factorization, in fact, for many people, it's synonymous with factorization, is principal components analysis. Okay? And principal components analysis is, I'll explain it three different ways. There's, uh, I mean, it is quite simply just this. What you do is you have the previous page, your phi there. Your phi end up being the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, the observed covariance matrix. So for those of you a little rusty on your linear algebra, the eigenvectors are the independent subspace, okay, or transform the subspace that's independent that spans directions of variation in X prime X. So X prime X is our information, or sorry, our covariance matrix. So these are independent directions of variation. Okay, in the high dimensional space of X here. And if we project from X through phi, then what we have is, from a linear algebra perspective, of a projection from X onto the independent subspace that underlies X prime X. Okay, so a projection into independent uh, 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 basis where things are independent from each other. So we have no more multicollinearity or anything like that. And the reason this thing is actually useful, the reason people work with it this way, is that they'll calculate phi for the whole spectral decomposition, in which case phi is p times p dimensional. It's a full subspace. Okay? But then they'll only use the biggest few principal components. And big here is measured in the size of the eigenvalue corresponding to those eigenvectors. Okay? So that's, I mean, that's principal component modeling, right? If there's a few things that are confusing here, one, if you don't know what an eigenvector or an eigenvalue is, even if you know what that is, but you don't really understand what it is, then this can be tough. Um, also, the idea that instead of working with V itself, we're projecting onto V, okay? That's one of the most confusing things about principal components when I explain them to my MBAs. And the way I get around that is I say, basically, you can think of the principal component as V. Just, you know, you won't get yourself in trouble if you equate the two things. Okay? But here's a couple other ways to think about principal components. And again, I think everybody here has seen this stuff. So I'm not talking to a total group of total novices, but, you know, maybe here are some other ways to understand what's going on with principal components. Okay? One way to think about what's going on with principal components is to think about the two-dimensional example. Okay. So what would a principal component look like where I have just x1 and x2? Okay. Well, imagine x1 and x2, and I fit a line through them. This is my OLS line, my least squares line. 
Okay. Then in x1 versus x2, I think I probably need to draw on this in here. In x1 versus x2, I have this line through here. For every observation, there's a point on that line that is closest to that point. Okay? For every observation, there's a point on the line that is closest to that observation. And the principal component score, the z, right, that we get out, that we throw in our regression models when we do principal component modeling, when we plot, when we're doing kind of a perception plot or something like that. The z, your principal component, is that point on the line. If you stretch a line through the points, the point on the line that's closest to your observation is the principal component score for that observation. And why is that useful? This gets to the intuition of why principal components are useful. Well, if I want to know both x1 and x2, in a picture like this where the line is pretty tight, the cloud of points is pretty tight around the line, all I really need to know is where that point is closest to along the line. Once I know where it lives along the line, I have a pretty good sense of the neighborhood where that observation lives in the higher dimensional x1, x2 space. Okay, so that's geometrically what's going on with principal components when you move just to two dimensions. And it's the same thing in higher dimensions. It's just harder for me to draw. Impossible for me to draw. <laughs> Now, many principal components. That was just the first one here. You recall I said you have as many principal components, columns of five potentially, as you have dimensions that you're trying to principally compose. Um, and what you have here is a picture of what the next, the second principal component would be. So the red line was the first principal component. Okay, it was the line that fit through the two of them. If you imagine taking the residuals from that first principal component and fitting a line through the residuals for the first principal component, well, it would have slope zero. Okay, so what defines that second principal component in this case is just that it's orthogonal to the first one. Okay, and so that's what I plotted here. If you wanted to imagine the second principal component, here's what it would look like. And the reason that in general we worry about the first principal components, the variance is the length of this line. Okay, so the, the, the size of the eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector is the length of that line. You can imagine this point here is 2, this point here down here is 2, so the length of that line is 2, square root of 2 squared. No, the length of that line is the square root of 16. Um, and this line is obviously shorter. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to calculate what it is. So this line is obviously shorter. This line is also far less useful. Okay? If I know where you live on this line here, okay, if I know where you live on that line there, it tells me very little information about what your original x1 and x2 are. Whereas where if I knew where you lived on the red line, I knew everything about where your x1 and your x2 are. So that's principal components in two dimensions. Here's the other way to understand what's going on with principal components, and it's a greedy algorithm. Okay, so this fits in with what we were doing with subset selection. Um, imagine you wanted to find a set of factors. Okay, you wanted to find a set of underlying factors that explained variation in all of your high dimensional x's. Okay, well you would, and these are latent factors. It's not like v exists. It's not like y where we can measure it. Okay, v is out there. So what we try and do is find the single v, okay, univariate v, one of them for every dimension, that maximizes the average correlation between that v and all of the x's. Okay, so imagine we were fitting a line for each x on v, doing a bunch of independent linear regressions, least squares. Okay, we try to find the, the v such that our average r squared across all of the lines for each individual x is as high as possible. What you do is you find that V, okay, the thing that gives you the average highest correlation with each of the X's, and you call that your first principal component. Okay? Then you do, you take the residuals from that first set of regressions, and you do the same thing, okay? Except now you're working with residuals, residuals on X's, okay? So you have, if you have P X's, you have P sets of, of residuals, okay? And you try and find the new V2, let's call it, getting creative, call V2 the latent variable that you find that has highest average correlation with all of those x's. And you do this over and over again, you're just creating these factors out of thin air, 
because they're just numbers that are highly correlated on average. So that's, that's the way, that's the algorithm. This algorithm could be used, let me say it that way, this algorithm could be used to get principal components. It's not because there's faster algorithms to do it. You decompose the matrix and such, but you know, this is an easier way to understand it. Yeah? Well, that's because you're taking residuals. So these are least squares fit, so the residuals. But yeah, good point, very good point. The question was, how do I constrain these factors to be orthogonal? And the answer was, because we're doing least squares fits, we're maximizing our squares in a line, uh, and then we're looking at residuals. The residuals are, by definition, orthogonal. OK, so that's, that's a little bit, I don't know, maybe if you, if you had never heard of principal components before, you're still lost because, you know, that they're, they're not something you can learn in two slides. But if you had heard of them before, perhaps that gives you a little slightly different intuition for them. Um, here's an application of them, back to the SNPs. This is uh, a few guys who are actually all now at Chicago, I think. They weren't when they did this. But um, it's, it's a princi principal component decomposition of uh, genetic expression data. So go back to the SNPs that we had in the very first example, the GWAS thing. This is a similar thing, except there's no phenotype. There's no why that they're trying to predict. They were just trying to understand what drives variability and expression of, I'm not sure what they did, but you guys can imagine it being the minor allele frequency. Okay? And what they do is this big high dimensional 8,000 or, or 16,000 dimensional thing, um, which is expression at all of these various locations. They fit a factor model, a principal component analysis model to it, and figure out, you know, what is my first dimension of variation? What is my first principal component, my dominant principal component? What is my second principal component orthogonal to that? And they got those out, and these are for people in, in Europe, and, and the picture here, each dot on that picture, not the big circles, the big circles are aggregates by country, but each dot is an individual and that individual gene, okay, so that person's DNA information, their score in the principal component decomposition of DNA on the first two axes, the first two uh, dominant sources of variation. And they got this out, and, and John and looked at it, and he, they kind of turned it around, and they realized that it looks like a map of Europe. Okay, so if you kind of turn it around and you color by country, you have the Iberian Peninsula coming off the side. Britain and Scandinavia are kind of messed up together, so that tells you a little bit about migration patterns up there. But generally, if you shift it and you do the magic eye thing, it looks as though um, we're reproducing a map of Europe. So the people's location in a reduced form factorization of their genetic information looks as though if you slant it, maps up with where they're from, okay? Which to put that in scientific terms means that the dominant sources of variation in this European gene pool is geographic, okay? So that's just like a nice stylized example, but it's good to have in the back of your mind the power of these sorts of things and also what they're going towards. They're going towards these dominant sources of variation. You probably already knew this, right? But there it is, it's in the data. Here's an example. Um, that's big in social science, okay? And here's an example of factorization um, that I think is useful for understanding, really getting a sense of the intuition as to what goes on with principal components. Fitting these things is really easy. I think even Stata could probably fit principal components very, very quickly. Um, but, but understanding what you get once you fit the principal components, often they're not going to line up with a map of Europe. So often you're going to have to do some investigative work and do some, some, some uh, put some effort in to figure out what we're working with. Because just working with principal components in a vacuum is a pretty dangerous exercise because when things go wrong, you can't diagnose what went wrong in your model, etc. So here's an example, Congress and roll call voting. So. Um, Everybody here probably knows this, but I'll go through it. Roll call votes are votes where they take attendance. So people are there, and we record who was there and how they voted, okay? whether they vote yay, nay, or whether they were absent or, or uh, abstained. The website voteview.com maintains a massive record database of all of these votes. Okay, for Congress going back to a long, long time ago. I don't know how far back they have. They have at least the mid-1800s. 
And um, there's, a, of course, an R package that just will download whatever you want from this, but you can also just go to the website and get them. Okay. Um, we're going to look at the 111th, which I'm sure Jesse could tell me which one that was, but I kind of forget. It's pretty recent. I think it's like four years ago. Um, three, three to four years ago. And it's 45 members in the U.S. House, uh, 1,647 votes. The nays are coded as minus one and the yeas are coded as plus one and the missing are coded as zero. So what my X is here is 445 individuals by 1,600 votes and each X entry is a plus one if it was a yay for that person, a minus one if it was a nay for that person, and a zero if they weren't there. And factorization of this voting behavior is a very common exercise in political science. It's really one of the like key exercises in quantitative political science in the US. And the idea is that you figure out dominant sources of variation in voting behavior, and that those dominant sources of variation in voting behavior correspond to notions of political science and political economy that you understand and would like to interpret. When you run, so I've put it up there just so you guys have it again. I think it really is helpful to remember what model this is fitting. The expected value of x here is some uh, uh, function, linear function, of the underlying factors, those v's. And those v's are the things that we don't know and we're going to estimate. We also don't know the phi's, but we get them for free, basically. And the, the v here, just so that everybody's on the same page, that little vi1 is univariate. It's a single number. And that phi1 there is p-dimensional, because it's the thing that translates from a univariate factor up to the high-dimensional uh, vote space. So go back to my line, my original point on my line in two dimensions, okay? V would have been the score along that line, that red line, and phi would have been the bivariate thing that says, okay, well, for a score on that line, I think your x is here, your x1 is here, and I think your x2 is over here, okay? So it's the key that translates back and forth between dimensions. The plot I have here is the variance of the principal components, okay? Um, so the variance of the z's, which is x times phi, which you can just think of as v if that's confusing. Um, this is the variance of this principal components, which is really related to the length of that line that you stretch through the data. And for the linear algebra people, it's the square root of those eigenvalues. And there's a huge drop in variance from the first to the second, which means that most of the variability in x is play, explained by the first principal component, okay? Uh, and then there's more drops after that. So political science literature, or what I understand of it, um, which is a little tiny bit, holds that the first principal component is usually enough to explain voting behavior in Congress, okay? Stylistically, there's, the, there's two periods when people said, hey, there's a meaningful second uh, uh, second principal component here that makes sense to us as a notion, uh, as a meaningful political concept, and that's in the 1860s and the 1960s. So what is it? Probably it's race. Okay. So that's what's mattered. The rest of the time here, there is still variability in the second principal component, but it's not. Uh, uh, it's not generally seen as that key. Here they are plotted. Okay. So here's the principal component directions in the 111th house. Um, I've colored them by party, right? So the x-axis is the first principal component and the y-axis is the second principal component. And I've colored them by party here. Um, the signs, the plus minus on a principal component is completely arbitrary. So inconveniently here, um, I guess the people on the right of the image are Democrats and the people on the left of the image are Republicans. Since it's arbitrary, I guess I should have just multiplied them, but hey, there you go. Um, there's clear separation on that first principal component, okay? Um, the second one, and the first one is basically party, right? It looks as though that gives us a nice cleavage between parties. The second one is not so clear. In fact, well, almost by definition, it's orthogonal to party because party is explained in the first one. Um, and it's really kind of this weird, heavy-tailed sprawl towards negative values. Okay. Interpreting the principal components, you can look at, um, so what I have here, these are actually 
principal component scores for individuals. So these are really big negative ones. The big negative ones were out towards the left in our thing, which turns out from this to be the right in the political spectrum, the way we think about where people sit in, in France. And um, the right out here is kind of these conservative Republican guys. Same thing, the left, the ones that get big positive values. Um, the left, very liberal. They are on the right of my picture. And you, you uh, can look those guys up. They're all fairly liberal members. The, third, the second principal component is really unclear. There's a mix of people here. You probably recognize some names. It's not clear to me that if you put these, say, six people here in a room, they would ever agree on anything. So it's not really clear what they're voting on. You can also try to interpret principal components not by looking at who scores what and by mapping that up to something that you do know. Okay, So that's what I just did, by the way, to back it up a sec. What I just did is I had principal components and I compared those to something that I knew something about, Okay, party. And I use that as a way to try and build a story for and interpret my principal components, because that's a useful thing to do. That's one way of building intuition about principal components. The second way that you can build intuition about principal components is by looking at the projections themselves. So from an individual X, where does that X make me live in principal component space? Okay, so what are the phi's for these individuals? If I vote yay on this issue over here, what does that say about where I live in principal component one space? Or actually for us here, because we're trying to Sherlock Holmes this thing, what does that mean about principal component two space? Okay, so here are the loadings for the first principal component. Um, positive and negative, okay. Uh, most of the votes don't matter. So this is a histogram of all of the loadings, okay. You notice that there's a hump in the middle. Those are votes with low loading. So whether you voted yay or nay or you were missing, it didn't move you much in any direction on the first principal component. Its loading was about zero because it didn't really matter for ideology or partisanship, which is what we figured out that first component is. The ones out at the edge, those spikes at the edge, those are votes that say a lot about your partisanship, what you believe, what party you're a member of, depending upon how you want to interpret these things. And in particular, the votes that have really big loadings here are votes that were associated with one party or another, but had a lot of cross-party voting. Okay, so one of the big ones I have up here is TARP. TARP, something that was you know seen as a liberal uh, Democrat uh, Democratic issue, but a lot of Democrats did not vote for it. Okay, on the other end over here we have the Affordable Health Care Amendment. This particular amendment, I forget what it is, I think it's like 1147 of the votes, was basically don't do it and never do it. Okay? So it was a very right way, it was very Republican, uh, uh, very Republican vote. Okay? And it was actually so far in that direction that many Republicans voted against it. So it had this cross party. So this lends a little bit of credence to the political science interpretation of these components of these factors at not just party, as not just party, but actually ideology. They give us some sense of not just what party you belong to, but whether you're to the right of your party or to the left of your party, et cetera. Okay, so that's the last political science that I'll do. It's really not what I do. Um, so trying to figure out that second principal component, we can do the same thing. Okay, and let's look at the largest loadings. So that's what I did. I just printed out the largest, biggest, absolute loadings for, um, for this principal component, okay, for the second principal component. Then I went and I looked and I looked up the votes. What was that vote? Well, it turns out that all of these things are like the one with the biggest loading, which is 429 legislators voted for resolution 1146, which is supporting the goals and ideals of a Cold War Veterans Day. Okay. You don't even have to vote for a Cold War Veterans Day here. You just got to say you like the idea and the things that a Cold War Veterans Day is about. So if you did not vote for this, you were either not a politician, and all these people are politicians, or you weren't there. And bingo, that's it. The second principal component here is just attendance. Okay, so it's people who were not voting for things that everybody else voted for. All of these people here were uh, by-elections or like uh, Pelosi, they had other important jobs going on at the same time. Okay, 
So that's the sort of exercise that I want people, I would like to see people go through whenever they try and use these factorization methods, is put some effort into figuring out what you've actually done when you factorized. Now, how do we use these things? Getting back to our key goal today, which is really prediction. How do we use these things in prediction? Well, the concept is, 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 is insanely simple. You just put the factors in your regression instead of the original x's. It could not be easier. If you have a two-factor uh, decomposition, you just do y onto z1 and z2 and you're done. Okay, so it's very, very straightforward. And it works well for a couple different reasons. One, it reduces dimension. The principal components reduce dimension of a prediction problem and they help you stop overfit, which we know is a big problem with high dimensions. It's still a high dimensional model because you're using all of the x's. However, those x's, when we're doing unsupervised dimension reduction, were reduced, you know, without any attention to y. Okay, they were just reduced in and of themselves. They were found, they explained x, and then we're saying, okay, well, how does y relate to this summarization of x? Okay, so you avoid overfit in that matter. When you have supervised factorizations, which are good because you can pick up rare events, it's less simple because you can overfit the factors themselves, in which case you can overfit even when you're regressing onto one factor, okay, because that factor has been sort of super optimized to help you predict y. Um, We'll do this, uh, oh sorry, the second thing that's nice about them is that they're independent. Now obviously the sampling distribution of these guys is not independent, right? They're actually the absolute value of the principal component is negatively correlated with each other, okay? But within a sample, they are independent, okay? And so from the kind of, if, you're, if you think about them as just being dropped on you and you're going to do some regression onto these principal components, all of the nice things that come from orthogonal x's that really only exist in theory actually exist in practice here, at least conditional on the x's, not unconditionally. Uh, so if we want to do a factor regression for COM score, it's as simple as saying the expected value of y given x is not a linear function of x per se. It is still a linear function of x, but it's a function of z times beta, okay, where z here are principal components. Factor regressions are very popular in social science, okay? So finance and uh, uh, political science, these are the way you do things, okay? Macroeconomics as well, quite often they're, they're big emphasis on factor regressions. They're not always fit via principal components in social science. In fact, in the, the political science literature, the vote view stuff, they don't, okay? But the results are very, very similar to what you get if you use principal components. It's just that there's a story that goes into the way that they've decided to fit factors. It, it, you can think of it as principal components. Okay, so people in social science like the factors for the reason we just went through, they tell stories, right? So not only are they a good predictive model, but you can get into the business of interpreting your factors and coming up with stories for your factors and latent underlying things like ideology or uh, 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 momentum type stuff, okay? So there's nice, nice social science work that can be done there and helpful theory building. You do have to be careful though, okay? I see very often that people trying to use factor regressions where there really is no factor structure in X. In other words, where the X's are pretty much independent from each other. Imagine if your X's are independent from each other, there's no factor structure because factor structure induces dependence between the X's, okay? Or it could be that you have a factor structure in X, but that it's not related to the dominant sources of variate, or sorry, that Y is not related to the dominant sources of variation, and so principal component regression becomes a bad way of doing things. Okay? How do you choose the number of factors? This is tough, actually. So um, without supervision, okay, so choosing the number of factors just to explain x well is a very tough game. Um, there are information criteria for it, okay, but in general the approximations are, are weaker and not nearly as tight as the approximations that go into a BIC or an AIC for a regression model. And the reason for that is that your parameter space is different. Instead of just having beta, which is the size of x, okay, the size of the dimension of x, now you have uh, phi's, which is like your beta, as well as v. And the tricky thing about v is that this is a parameter whose dimension 
who, whose dimension on one side of the matrix is the same as n. You have as many v's as you have n. So any approximation like the Laplace approximation to that integral that I said goes into the information criteria that's going to work well as n gets big. Well, that's as n gets big, not as n and p get big. Okay, so those approximations don't work nearly as well for factor models. People still use them, but you just got to be aware that as you're getting to large numbers of factors, you don't believe what's going on. Okay? Um, once you have principal component regression, however, now we're completely within the wheelhouse of cross-validation. Right? So we fit this thing, and we're not even really cheating when we fit a principal component analysis first, because we're not using Y. There's a little bit of theoretical argument as to whether you know, it's cheating to first calculate principal components, whether you should do that within your cross-validation loop or not. Okay? Um, but in any case, it's not that bad a thing to do. Calculate your principal components outside of the cross-validation loop. And then like we did with the uh, semiconductor data, just go through combinations of principal components and see how well different combinations of principal components predict Y out of sample. Okay? So that's, that's not a bad thing to do. In fact, it's a very good trick for choosing the number of factor models, especially when you have regression. There's two ways that people do this. One of them is you build a candidate set of models. Okay, so, sorry, let me back it up. Whenever we want to evaluate to use cross-validation, that does not select models for us. It just allows us to compare models. We need to come up with a candidate set of models. There's two ways that people come up with candidate sets of models for principal component regression. One is that they go include all of the K largest principal components, K largest various pr variance principal components. So I would have a one principal component model. Then I would have a model that includes principal components one and two. Then a model that includes principal components one, two, and three. Okay, so that's a nice, easy way to come up with a set of candidate models. Or you can do what we did with the semiconductor data, and you can actually just throw in all principal components and regress onto these guys using some path estimation technique. Then there's no guarantee that you're going to get you know, the first three principal components, you could get the first, the 23rd, and the 43rd, or something like that, okay? Um, the standard in the industry is to do the first one. There's really no reason to do it that way that I can think of or that I've seen. Um, so if you're used to working with lasso stuff, you can feel free to mix and match your techniques and apply lasso to uh, uh, apply lasso after you've done a principal component factorization. If you're curious about how the approximation breaks down, there's a lot of literature of this. Larry Wasserman and Catherine Broder have it for mixture models, okay? So how BIC breaks down for mixture models. A mixture model is just a principal component where you force V to be one and is zero elsewhere, okay? So you can only have one of those things, and so the theory pulls through, and the intuition is, is the same. So when I fit principal components to the COM score data, okay, so these are my X's here are website uh, uh, frequencies, sorry, the proportion of time you spent on different websites. And something else I should mention that came up earlier in this context was that the, the, the X's here, principal components, they are not scale independent. So in other words, the size of X matters. So almost always, unless you have a really weird scenario, what you are factorizing is X divided by the standard deviation of X, okay? Because you want everything to be unit free. And so that's what I've done here. These are the frequencies that people have spent on different websites or proportion of time that people have spent on different websites divided by the standard deviation for that website. Uh, the first one is all ad trackers and providers, so maybe this is going to be useful for actually predicting what people spend online. The second one's porn, um, so I won't list the domain names. Okay. So we can fit through a, a uh, do the lasso, so I only fit 100 here, okay? Um, and actually I should say that there are techniques for fitting principal components on really big data sets. Okay, um, generally these add up to fast distributed ways, which Matt's going to talk about a little bit later, of calculating X prime X, 
okay? And then doing an eigenvalue or approximate eigenvalue decomposition of X prime X. But there's a big literature out there. There's, there, there's lots of stuff out there. I fit the first 100 here just because I wanted to finish pretty quickly. And here's the out of sample picture that we get. Okay, the out of sample picture on the right, okay, that's my, that's my coefficient path, right? So this is my, my how my betas on the uh, uh, pr 100 principal components change as I move lambda, okay? The left is the picture that's far more useful. The right picture is useful for learning about the lasso. It's yes, less useful for evaluating it. The picture on the left is the uh, uh, out of sample performance, the five-fold out-of-sample performance for those different levels of lambda penalization. In other words, those different penalizations or uh, combinations of principal components that we include there. It looks in this case like we need a pretty complicated model. Okay, so the, the curve really flattens out and does not start to go back up again. Okay, if I had fit all the way out to 8,000 principal components, which I could have done, I could have grabbed all the way out to that many principal components, it would have started to go back up again, but it might have taken a while. So to put that in other words, it looks like we might not have a really nice low dimensional factor structure here, or at least not one that's easy to measure, or at least not one that's directly related to spending. Okay, so to put that in one other way, okay, if I look at this, and I realize that estimating, once I get out past a certain number of principal components, I know that the variability in the principal component estimation starts to get big once you are estimating principal components with really low variance that correspond to the small eigenvalues. I'm gonna get worried about that estimation variance overwhelming any sort of predictive ability that I have once I start to have to include too many principal components. So I might worry here that I don't have a factor structure. Even more simple than that, back it up, I think often people forget the big picture here. Let's look at the y-axis here, which is the Gaussian deviance, okay? The Gaussian deviance here is my, about 2.65. This is our out of sample predictive performance on uh, log consumption, uh, um, uh, on estimated log consumption. Okay, remember that number. Camera guy, you don't have to follow me. I'm gonna flip back through a bunch of slides. So last time we saw out of sample evaluation for COM score, okay? And the low point here is about 2.55, okay? These are comparable, right? There's no magic in cross-validation. I'm just predicting Y, five-fold left out with stuff that uh, uh, models fit to data uh, uh, training sample and predicting on the left out validation sample. Here, the best model when I use all the X's and I'm doing variable selection on them is about 2.5 something. Back up here. The best we can do is 2.6 something, okay? So none of the factor models that I could come up with here did better than the variable selection method, which indicates probably principal component regression is not what you would want in this setting, okay? And that's a useful thing to know. Right, so that's a useful thing to understand about web browsing, and I actually thought it would work better because I imagined there were factors of this sort of thing, and maybe there are, but my ability to measure them versus my ability to look at a few websites and set things to zero means that the lasso on, on raw website counts did better. One point to remember about this, a uh, question, sure. So a question. Yeah. Would we, would we ever expect, um, we're gonna be doing lasso validation anyways, would we ever expect Yes, right. So, so the the question was, hey, would it ever work better to do principal component regression? Uh, and the answer is definitely yes. It does very commonly uh, work better. Um, and the reason is that you are. The reason is actually the last point down here. This is a dense model. Okay, this is not a model that has set the coefficients on any individual website to zero, right? We've selected on the principal components, but even if we include one principal component, then the loading on an individual X can be backed out. So it's gonna be beta on that principal component, okay, times the rotation or the loading on X for that principal component. So this is a dense model. 
Okay? If you rewrote this model as a regression onto all of your x's, it would include all of the x's. And so the shrinkage is different than just setting things equal to zero. The shrinkage is this linear subspace explanation for x first and then second stage, selecting how many linear bases you actually need. Okay, so the difference is whether that's a good model, whether the dense factor structure is a good model, or whether the sparse variable selection is a good model. And that's something that will change depending upon the context you work in. Um, and we see that actually in these, these coefficients that you pull out here. Okay, so these are large absolute value scaled coefficients if I back them out. And again, this is dense. They're way, way smaller. Okay, so these are, these are um, much, much, much smaller than the uh, uh, values that we saw earlier. That's because it's dense and everything's correlated with each other. So if you spend an extra percent of time on victoriasecret.com, then you also spend an extra percent of time on 100 other websites that have a similar beta, which increases my expectation of how much you buy. I have the raw ones in here as well, but so you can see what's big on, on each. There's Mandalay Bay again. So it turns out if you want to predict people's spending, you should look at how much time they spend on casino websites. It's not bad. Okay. Um, so again, the principal component regression, another way to realize it might not be working that well, is if you look in here, the big betas in that principal component regression are not on the big principal components. They're on like numbers 18, 35, and 22 which means that y really is not related to the dominant sources of variation in x, which means I might do better with a variable selection technique. Alternative factor models. And I think I might see how much time I have. Okay, so we might end a, a little bit early. This will set up what Matt is going to talk about in the next two worlds, uh, next two hours. Um, so. Let's think about what I just did, and this is an important thing to do. Uh, what was the model that we fit when we factorized with principal components? Well, it was fitting a line through stuff. Okay, that algorithm that I told you about, either the greedy algorithm or the two-dimensional cartoon that I gave you of principal components, or like I said, if you're up on your linear algebra, the idea of what an eigenvector is. Okay, all of those are minimizing least squares objective functions. Okay, and when you minimize a least square objective function, you're fitting a line through stuff. And we know that it's generally not a good idea to fit a line through things that don't look like a line is a good expected value for the data. In particular, what we have here is 99% or more than 99% of the data is zero. Okay, so browsing on websites, most of the time you spent zero time on any of these websites. Okay, so what we're doing here when we do principal components is analogous to you if you had a Y that was 99% zero with a couple little X's and you fit a line through that and you reported the slope of that line in your paper. Okay, might do that, probably not the best idea. Usually functional form really doesn't matter, but when it's this extreme, it does start to matter. And so there are a bunch of alternative factor models out there for this type of data. Okay, you can think about text counts, you can think about website counts, you can think about counts for various dictionaries that people use to decompose images and things like that. A lot of the things that people work with in machine learning and in data mining are counts of stuff. So a very productive area of high dimensional research and data mining research has been coming up with models and factor models for counts of stuff. Okay. So that's the last thing I'm going to talk about here, which is what would be a factor model for counts of stuff, and Matt will talk about this a little bit more later on. But remember our principal component factorization. It's that equation up there. The expected value of x is some linear function of the v's. Okay. And really what we assume around this when we fit principal components is that it's a normal with that mean and a variance sigma squared. It's actually an independent variance. And that's what we do. That's where our model estimates come from, is deviance minimization for that normal Gaussian multivariate model. Instead, for count data, the way we usually model count data, big high dimensional count data, is with a multinomial. 
Okay, so a multinomial is just you imagine you have your bucket of balls, you have your yellow balls, your red balls, and your green balls, and there's a probability distribution, okay, in that there's a, a, a certain number of red balls, certain number of green balls, certain number of yellow balls. And if you're going to pull out 10 from there, and after you pull out each one, you put the ball back in, and then you pull it out, and then you put it back in, and you record how many you get. The distribution for the number of balls you get that are red, green, or yellow, that distribution of that vector is called a multinomial. That's our standard distribution that we use for modeling count data. And so a factor model for count data just factorizes the mean of that distribution. Okay? It factorizes the probability over balls. And so what it does here is it has x is distributed as a multinomial, okay, my big high dimensional x, and now x is count. So x is no longer percent of time you spent on websites. For example, x is going to be count number of times you visited this website, number of times you visited that website, number of times you visited that website. And that count vector is assumed to have been drawn from a vector of a, a set of probabilities, okay, and a probability specific for that person, and the factorization just says that the probability for that person is a weighted combination of some underlying factors. Okay? And those underlying factors are probabilities over websites. So say, for example, we have someone that uh, goes to a lot of shopping websites, their factor would have a lot of high probability on those ad click those, those Google syndicate type stuff, because those people are getting exposed to a lot of advertisement. And factor two, you had the porn people, and so they would have heavy weights on all the porn sites. Okay? And then if you're someone who shops a lot and surfs a lot of porn, you would have kind of a 50-50 weighting between those two underlying factors. Okay? And so that's what it is. That's a topic model. I'm not going to talk any much more about it because we'll mention it. It's a little bit too much for the very end of the day. Um, but it's just good to understand that the wide world beyond everything we talked about today, a lot of it has to do with better models for functional form like this. It's also called latent Dirichlet allocation. That's the kind of the original name by Blind and all. The topic models really can do better than factorizations. And I used to be a little bit skeptical of this, but I've encountered scenarios in empirical research where something works. I have some idea that works on a factorization, and it works when I do the factorization with a topic model, and it does not work when I do the factorization through principal components. So this is kind of the, the site up there is one of the papers, it's, a, it's an applied paper I have, where we're looking at, we have sentiment on, uh, um, we have Twitter, so a bunch of tweets coming in online, and we have all of these tweets have been scored for whether people are happy or whether they're sad, and in particular whether they're happy or supportive of a particular politician that they're talking about in their tweet or not supportive of a particular politician they're talking about in their tweet. And the way we decided as to go out there and gather tweets that we would actually pay someone to read and say, hey, this is thumbs up for Rick Santorum or this is thumbs down for, for Mitt Romney because that costs money. The way that we selected those tweets was by factorizing all of the tweets out there about these individuals and then doing some experiment design, choosing the tweets to be well spread out in that reduced dimension space of what people are talking about. When we did that with a factor model, a PCA, sorry, when we did that with principal component, actually I'll start with the good, when we did that with topic models, it works great. Out of sample, fantastic. Turns out we were grabbing good tweets for learning about what people were talking about online. When I did the exact same thing with principal components, it failed miserably. Okay? And that's where functional form really matters. In a tweet, the number of words that you say is much, much larger than the number of words you, or sorry, number of words you didn't say is much, much larger than the words that you did say. So it really does matter. These functional form things, beyond this, this is kind of big picture, beyond this stuff, the functional form stuff really can matter, and that's where people could go if they want to learn more about these methods. You can move further in that way. Whenever you deviate from linearity, though, it becomes more expensive to fit these things, and they take longer. Okay? And so there's ways out there to, you know, I don't know, I have stuff on approximating the information criteria. 
okay, quickly so that you don't have to use cross-validation. Other people take the very reasonable approach of just fitting them faster so that you can do cross-validation and stuff like that. And there's a bunch of stuff out there. A lot of machine learning these days is concentrated on approximations to these nice functional forms that you can fit in a reasonable amount of time. And the equation is always that you give up a little bit or sometimes a lot in precision in order to work with a functional form that better represents the data you're working with that's nonlinear. Okay? You give up some precision though because these things are going to be tougher to fit so you're going to have to use approximate methods to fit the things. You're not just going to get to minimize deviance, you're going to have to get close to the minimum of deviance and that trade-off is there. So just be aware of that as something that plays into whether a machine learning method would be appropriate for what you're working on. Topic modeling of COM score. Here's what you get, the first few topics. Um, you know, you can go through these and interpret these. These are things, websites that have high probability within that topic. And not only do they have high probability, they have high probability lift within these various topics. Okay, and what that means is that the word, or sorry, the website is much more probable within that topic than it is in general browsing behavior. So, I don't know, the last one there is like a gaming one, freeslots.com is not a very common website that people go to, but it has high probability in this gaming topic, and so its lift is quite high and it helps us identify what that topic is getting at. Unfortunately, the punchline is a bit of a letdown. Here, the precision that we've lost in using an approximate method to fit these things, I use the topics function in R. Um, the precision that we lose there is, is worse than any sort of benefit we get by using the fancier functional form, which is a good lesson, I think. Um, and in this case, what happens is the, uh, uh, the out of sample deviance is now 2.87 something. Okay, so now it's higher than we got either with principal components or that we got with, uh, uh, or that we got with um, just straight up variable selection. This is for the comp score regression again. Okay, so in conclusion, here's the recipe. Okay, the recipe is as follows. You build a forward stepwise, stepwise path of candidate regularized models. Okay, that's step one. Then you choose amongst that forward stepwise path of candidate regularized models using cross-validation or, if you don't have enough time to cross-validate, information criteria. The best is to do both and ask yourself some soul-searching questions if they disagree. Um, if you have a factor structure or if you think you have a factor structure, try doing that as well. Just because you think you have a factor structure doesn't mean it's useful for predicting why. And so you want to include its out of sample deviance as something that you try and evaluate and compare that to the variable selection techniques. Uh, there's a ton more to data science, which is kind of like big data, just a new term that got made up. But, um, you know, one of the things that we really, if I had, you know, Thankfully, I don't. If I had, you know, a few more hours, I would talk a lot about supervised factor models. That's something I work on a lot. And that's important because for picking up rare signals, again, you don't want to just factorize X in general. You want to find the underlying dimensions of variation in X that are related to your really rare signal of interest. There's a lot going on there. The terminology of inverse regression is what people like myself like to use when talking about those things. Supervised factor models. There's a lot of stuff there. Okay. Other ways that you can go are nonlinear models that we haven't really talked about at all. And the best of those, this relates to a couple questions I got at breaks, the best of those I think are things based on trees or decision trees, which most people are familiar with. A very, very simple model for explaining the world. And what you do is you kind of shrink towards that simple model and then look at combinations of decision trees, mixtures of decision trees to build in interaction, to build in nonlinearity. Um, more generally, a lot of what I said today can be replaced with, sorry, the, the task select a model can be replaced with weight models, in which case your prediction ceases to be just a single model prediction. It becomes a weighted average of a bunch of model predictions. That's beneficial for a few different reasons. One of them is it introduces stability. It lowers the sampling variance of your prediction. 
because you're not choosing just one model, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, you're averaging over a few candidate models. Okay? So stability is much better. It also has kind of, in general, expected optimality as well. So you will do better on average in prediction as well. Um, so those are called model averaging if you're a Bayesian, ensemble methods if you're not. They're very, very popular. They're a key part of a lot of machine learning. Then there's all the distributed stuff that Matt's going to talk about. And that's it for me. So thank you guys very much.